So now what we want to do is use some of these newfound skills in some more practical applications of uh, regular expressions. So let's go back to the way we first tore apart strings and, and look at the situation where, we, if you recall, we just wanted the host name, right? This is an email address and we're interested in the host name. So we have this string and we go find the at, right? The find looks up and tells us the at is at position 21. And then what we do is we say, okay, let's look beyond there to the space. And that tells us the space is in position 31. And then we're saying we can extract starting at beyond the at sign up to but not including the space by saying at pose plus one colon space position. And when we get that, now we have to have a thing that decides to only look at this on from lines, but then it can print out the host that is extracting of this information. So that was one way that we did that, right? One way we did it. The next way we did this was the double split pattern, right? So we said, okay, let's take this line, let's break it into words based on spaces. That's what words is. So that's zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then we know that the email address on lines that start with from space is the second one. So we pull out email address, which pulls this bit out into email. And then we're going to split that again based on the at sign. So we're going to split this part again based on the at sign. So it splits right there, and then this becomes the 0 and 1 in pieces. And then pieces sub 1 is that host. And if we print that out, we get the host. So that's the double split pattern. Nice thing about that is you don't have to keep track. The little plus 1 is kind of annoying to use the space position. Um, the, that previous one, that's just hard to remember. It's just, I, I've written this code way too many times in my career and I've made mistakes and I have to debug it every single time and I print all these numbers out. I'm like, did I get it right? Oh, I did it in Python. I did it in Java. I did it in C. Wait a sec. I did it differently. And so it's, so this is a lot cleaner. I mean, I can write this every time and I know it's going to work every time. I barely even need to test this code because it's so obvious. So double split is another way of extracting stuff. But if we look at this thing with the regular expression, we can say, oh, okay, let's, um, Let's use a regular expression to do this. So we'll start looking through the string. We'll start so by saying, hey, let's look until we find an at sign. Then let's start extracting with the parentheses. And then once we have found the at sign, let's look for, for, for non-blank characters. This is a set of characters. This caret as the first one means not a blank. So that's another way to do non-blank, not a, a set of characters which are everything but blank. That's what this little bit is saying. Star means zero more times, which means it's going to run, 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 run until it finds a blank, which is going to stop it. The greediness is what keeps pushing it, right? It's, this is a greedy match. That asterisk is greedy because there's no question mark after it. And so that does go and starts at the at sign with the parenthesis, goes to the space, and that's the end parenthesis, and that's what prints out. Now, y is going to be a list that's a one item list that has the string in it that we're looking for, but you can just go sub zero to get that guy right out of there. Okay, so that's sort of the regular expression version of it, but we can make this a more fine tuned thing. So we can say, look, we don't, we also want to pick the line, and we want to know if there are, if we don't get that line, we want to skip it. If we do get the line, we want to extract the data. And we can do this all in a single regular expression. So again, we say start from the beginning of the line. And if the, it's got to be a from, followed by a space, and then followed by any number of characters, dot star, followed by an at sign. So, it, so this has to match. We see a space. Then we're going to have any number of characters. And then we're going to see an at sign. And then we're going to start extracting. And then we're going to go non-blank, 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 non-blank up blank and extracting and out that comes. And this has the advantage of the previous one in that that makes it much more precise. There, if we look at the previous one, while it works on good lines, it might actually trigger on lines that we actually don't want to see. So this allows us to refine it so it only actually does this to lines that we care about. So it's sort of a both an if statement uh, and, an, and a splitting extracting going on all at the same time by having a bigger string that we're matching, then we're extracting. It's a way to kind of clean up your data. So here is a simple program that we're going to just put all this together and actually accomplish something. And so we're going we're to read through and look for lines in a file that have this form. 
and we're going to extract this number and then we're going to uh, uh, compute the, the maximum of this. Okay, so we're going to extract this number and then convert it to a float and compute the maximum. So, you know, we're going to open a file, we're going to write a for loop, we're going to strip, so we're going to do this for every line of the file, but the first thing we want to do is not get line, we want to discard all the lines except ones that have this. So our, our regular expression is look for lines that start with x dash d spam dash confidence colon. So that's a pretty strong match. If that's not there, we're not going to get anything. And then there's a space, there's a space, and then start extracting, and then go as long, one or more digits and dots, that's a single character, and that's one or more, and then stop extracting. So that says, start extracting, da 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 da, greedy, 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 stop extracting. And so that's what we're going to get. Now, if the line doesn't have this, it means missing in some, other, some way, whether it's this prefix or this number, if the number's missing, it's going to fail too. We're going to get back a list, an empty list. So the first thing you have to do is check to see if you actually got a match. So you say, if the number of items in the list, len of stuff, is not equal to one, continue. And so this is the this is the skip all the lines that don't match. Skip, 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 skip. So there could be thousands of lines that don't match. But then when this match hits, it's going to come down and fall through. Right? So so that most of the lines will skip up, but then when we actually get one, and we know instantly that we've got one and stuff sub zero because that's what we extracted is this number. And we can take the floating point of it, we append it to our list, we made a list to store them, that runs, the list grows, and then we just say, what was the largest one? And so you can run this and see that. We have an escape character, and the whole idea is, is sometimes all these little special characters that make a lot of sense to us, we actually want to search for it. So what if we want to search for a dollar sign? Well, we just prefix it with the backslash. And that just means this is a real dollar sign. So backslash dollar is a real dollar sign. So this says, I would like a dollar sign followed by one or more digits or dots. And so that's going to match a dollar sign followed by one or more digits. Dots are okay. This is a set, remember. 0-9 or dot, that's a set of the list of legit characters. This is a range of characters that's a shortcut to how to make the set. You could make it be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, 9, dot or 0 dash 9 and it assumes that and that's one or more so then it stops because this is a space it's greedy matching then it pulls this out so that's kind of why greedy has to be the default because uh, because otherwise if it wasn't doing greedy matching oops come back come back if it wasn't doing greedy matching it would um, if it wasn't doing greedy matching it would stop here because it would find a dollar sign non greedy would find a dollar sign and one character, and then it would give us $1 rather than $10. So, in summary, uh, regular expressions are a cryptic but powerful language, and uh, they're, they're an acquired taste. Uh, I think that, I bet eventually you'll find them fun, even though uh, on your first impression you might not think that they're so fun. Welcome to Networked Programs. This is chapter 12. Now we're going to learn a little bit about how we talk to resources on the network using Python. Now, this is a really quick introduction to how the network really works. I have a whole book that I wrote. Um, it's also translated into Spanish on how the network works, starting at the very lowest layer packets and everything right on up. And it's actually really easy to read. I wrote it for a high school audience. Um, it's a short book and pretty easy to read. So if you read that book, you will understand that there is this layered architecture, uh, the TCP architecture that sort of runs our network at the lowest layer that on one side here, this is your computer and this is a server computer. And if you sort of want a web page, it goes across the network, does this like 15 or 20 times, then it goes up into the server, reads the data, and then the data comes back 15, 20 hops for the packets, and then it's shown to you as what you see. Um, and so that's how it works. And there's these layers that we're not going to talk about in this section, but I talk about in that book. Um, the layers of the link layer, which talk about how to get over one hop. The internet layer, which talks about how to construct, say, 15 or so hops to get packets back and forth. That's the, the sort of lower level bits. We're going to start at what we call the transport layer. And that's the layer where 
your computer sort of assumes that it can make a, a phone call to another computer, another process running on a, a program on this computer, talks to a program on this computer, and then it kind of comes back. Okay, and so we're going to we're going to leave this alone. We're going to ignore it. We're going to assume that there's this nice, reliable pipe that's going from point A to point B. And what are we going to do with the pipe? But if you're interested, take a look at the book. So we're just going to start with a pipe, uh, some kind of a connection. We have two processes, process, process, and we have some kind of a connection between them. And it is a connection that we can both use to talk and to listen. In nerd terms, we call these things sockets, and that is one process running on one computer, another process running on one computer, another second computer connected through the internet somehow, and one computer speaks into that socket and it comes out, and the other computer returns something and it comes. And so this is a bidirectional protocol of data, which is a series of, in effect, data phone calls between applications. So the application might be on your side, this might be your browser. Chrome, Firefox, Internet Explorer. On the other side, this is a web server. Might be Internet IIS, Internet something something from Microsoft, or Apache, or Java Tomcat. There's another program, and you are making phone calls between these programs. Now, in general, um, these servers here stay up all the time, and you sort of just can make a request when you feel like it on your in your program. But that's what we're going to do, and this is what we call a socket. So with that little connection, that phone call, that data phone call, is what we call a socket. Now, you have to decide which of the systems you're going to talk to and then which of the services on those systems or which process. And so we have this concept called port numbers, and they're best thought of like extensions on phones. So uh, one organization has one phone number, and it says, please enter the extension of the party you'd like to talk to. Well, that's kind of what ports are. They're like, here is, I'm a, I'm a server and I'm connected to the internet. Please enter the extension of the process that you would like to talk to. And so, for example, there might be processes running on various computers. And so the email is known to hang out on port 25 or extension 25. Login, insecure login lives on port 23. Insecure web lives on 80 and secure web lives on 443. And there's a couple of different protocols Say if you have your mail stored on Gmail and you have a local uh, mail client, say like Thunderbird or Apple Mail, that talks a protocol to pull that mail across and those live on various ports. So these ports are those extensions and by convention we have standards that tell us what to roughly expect at those ports. So when you're talking to port 80, you expect to talk to a web server or an HTTP uh, server. If you're talking on port 23, you expect to talk to a telnet server, and on and on and on and on. And so these are the extensions, the typical commonly used default extensions for various network application processes that are serving us data. Now sometimes you'll go to a URL and you'll see in that URL there's a colon and a number. That means it's a web server that's running on a port other than the official 80 or 443 port. Now in Python, we can talk to these sockets, right? We can just talk to them, and it's really easy, surprisingly easy. Um, we have to import socket, because that's a library. It comes with Python, but until you can use it, you can't use it in your uh, program until you say it. And then you, basically in the socket library, you call it socket function. That's what that syntax is saying. Um, you're making a socket. Now, the key to a socket, it's, it's like, sort of like a an unopened file handle. It's half of a file handle. It's an, it's an outward looking thing that's not yet connected. These parameters, you're just going to type them in. This says we're going to make a socket that goes across the internet and it's, it's a stream socket which means that it's a series of characters that come one after another rather than a series of blocks of text. There's another kind that's harder to deal with but we're going to do this. So this, don't worry about this line, just know that this creates a socket but not does not associate it. The very next line, we get back a socket a socket object in this variable that I'm storing in the variable my sock. And then when you want to make a connection across the internet to the far end, you say, "Oh, hey, dear socket, extend yourself across the internet. Make the phone call to this host data.pr4e.org and on that port 80." So that's making the phone call. This is like the phone number and this is like the phone extension. So that's we haven't sent any data yet. We have simply 
rung the phone of a process, hopefully living on port 80. If it's there, great. This might blow up. This one here won't blow up, but this line here could blow up. If there's nothing sitting on that process, it would come back and say, oh, you tried to call, you got no answer. That's a legitimate thing to happen. Maybe you don't have a network connection, or maybe that service is down on that server, or the whole server's down. But, um, so I just, it's kind of amazing that we're sitting here in Python, and in three lines we have uh, probably a half a million engineers have built this thing called the internet, all these protocols and all this software, and we just made use of it in three lines of Python. And I guess this is one of the reasons that people absolutely love Python. Absolutely love Python. So, now that we have a socket, we have to ask ourselves, what kind of data are we going to send, and then what kind of data are we going to expect to receive across that socket? So now we have a socket, we are going to talk about what we're going to do with it, right? So the socket basically functions at this level. Your application is saying, make me a socket, which is sort of this endpoint, and then the connect actually connects to an application on the far side. And there's a port involved, so that might be port 80. And this, this is the far host, and that could be www.py4e.org, or data.py4e.org. Okay, and so the socket is solving this, and, and the question then is, what are we going to send and what are we going to expect to get back? And that's what we call the application protocol. So we know that these two have made a phone call. And it's no different than making the phone call and saying, you know, hello, right? And uh, everyone knows that when you, the phone rings and you pick it up, you're supposed to say hello. Uh, and that's part of our protocol. So who talks first, right? So the dominant protocol that we use on this in this section is the HTTP protocol. It's the key is hypertext transfer, transfer protocol. It's dominant, it's really easy to use, that's why I use it as an example, but realize that there are many others like mail and file transfer and remote login and all kinds of other protocols. Each is a different application protocol. They all use sort of sockets at their lower level, but then on top of that, they layer the rules of the road for retrieving uh, hypertext web pages. And we have used these for all kinds of other things. So the protocol, like I said, is like who answers the phone first? What do they say? What happens if the person doesn't answer right? Can you hear me now? Those kinds of things. And it's a real simple thing. And, it, and all you really need to do is so that both sides can agree, you have to write a thing that's like the rules in the middle and say, okay, everybody, as long as we all do this, we'll be fine. It's as simple as picking on which side of the road the cars can drive on. It works fine no matter which side, but if each car randomly picked, it would be really kind of a mess. So if you look at the typical URL, and this is one of the things that uh, the web innovators in 1980 uh, really invented that was wonderful, and, and it seems second nature today, but in 1990 it was rather revolutionary, in that these uniform resource locators encrypted and included in themselves a protocol, the host to connect to, and the document to retrieve. So this is one of the clever, clever ideas that the web came up with because we used to have to pick a program like FTP or Telnet or whatever, SMTP, then we had to go to the right host and then we had to talk to that host a certain way. So in HTTP, it's a really simple protocol invented in 1989 and 1990 by uh, Tim Berners-Lee and Robert Caillou at, uh, World, at, the, uh, <clears throat> at CERN. And uh, they created a protocol that we have grown to know and love and use for way more than retrieving documents, as we'll see in the upcoming chapters. So we're going to talk a little bit about what happens when you click on a page that has a link. Now, there's all kind of fancy stuff that can go on, but this is the basics. And so let's just imagine for the moment you are sitting looking at a web page, drchuck.com slash page one, and inside that there is a hyperlink. It is a indication that says when you click on this page, go to a different page. And in that you see the name of the page that you're supposed to go to. So we click on this link and that is a browser. This is an application. This is a process or an app that's running on your computer. This is the browser, okay? And when the browser sees the click inside your computer, then the browser makes a connection to port 80 on the web server, drchuck.com, and sends the request. This request that it sends is precisely specified by a standard, which we will see in a second. 
Then the web server does some magic work. Oops, let's go back. Then the web server does some magic work in here, reads some files, runs some code, does whatever, constructs an answer to our phone call and sends it back. And it sends in this case back a web page in the format of HTML, the hypertext markup language, which is different than HTTP, which is the protocol that we're exchanging. HTML is the format of the document we're getting back. And in this has an anchor tag, href in the end of anchor tag, and some highlighted text. And now your, your browser gets this back and then renders it according to the rules of HTML and CSS and JavaScript, etc., parses it, and then makes a pretty web page. And this web page happens to have a link back to the first page, and if you click there, it will do this over and over and over again. And that is the request response cycle. And that's governed by a series of internet standards. These are standards that were built in the, from the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, and continue to this day by a group called the Internet Engineering Task Force, or IETF. Uh, the documents they produce are called RFCs, which stands for Request for Comments. The RFC, the word RFC is kind of like a, a, a sort of joke, as it were. It's a, uh, it's, uh, um, they're, they're trying to be kind of funny in that, uh, funny is not the right word. They're, it's, it's ironic in that they're trying to say, even some of the protocols of the internet that we've used for several decades, they're always interested in improvements. And that's what the RFC stands for. And they're all named RFC dash whatever. And if we were going to cruise around, we could find some various RFCs. And this is RFC 2616. Um, there, it might have been revised since then. But this is like a document. And this is what they look like. Hypertext Transfer Protocol version 1. And so you're reading this document. You're going to write a browser. And you want to talk to the application protocol that is HTTP. This is one of many documents that helps define what HTTP is. So if you look down and you look down and said, oh, here's what a request looks like. This is how I'm going to get a, get a document from the server. And you keep reading and you keep reading. And it says, um, you're supposed to have the request method with a space, with the request URI, the request method with a space, with the URI, with a space, the HTTP version, and the carriage return to the line feed. That's what it's saying. And so it looks kind of like this, right? We say get the document followed by a space. There's got to be one space. You do two spaces and it's going to be quite frustrating, okay? And so this is an example that you can run on uh, a number of, uh, on, on Linux operating systems and Win uh, Macintosh operating systems with no changes. If you install Telnet on your Windows box, you should be able to run something like this as well. So Telnet is a, a program that we used in the old days um, it used to be how we logged into servers, but because it doesn't encrypt your data back and forth, we don't use it anymore. But it, it basically is a program that can open a socket to a host on a port. And I'm saying Telnet to this host on port 80. And at this point, I am connected. And whatever I type on my keyboard is going to be sent to that server. Now, if you're doing this, you probably want to cut and paste this really fast. Uh, because if you take too long, most web servers will be like, you're a human. I don't want to talk to humans. I want to talk to programs. So remember to type this fast enough. And then you have to hit enter twice. So you have to have a blank line here. Just type this exactly as it's shown. And then you will get back the server. If you do it right, the server, and the server is properly configured, the server will give you back some headers. And this is metadata about the document you're going to get. For example, it's saying it's got text slash HTML, which means that the remaining stuff is going to be in HTML, hypertext markup language. It has a blank line and then the actual document, and then the connection is closed. And so if you do this, you can set this up in a way that you can run this on your own computer and in effect hack the, through the back door a web server. Now you can't hack the secure web servers and Mail servers used to be easy to hack, but they're harder to hack now because they challenge you for information. But part of the reason I'm so obsessed with the command line is this is how real hackers work. And they know how to talk some of these protocols more directly. And so we think of this beautiful, sophisticated application talking to some other thing. And it's all pretty. And we got wonderful clicky buttons and nice usability. But the reality is, like in the Matrix Reloaded here, uh, the kinds of things that really talented hackers are doing uh, use command lines and, um, and they really know what's going on and that's how they do it. They understand what's going on better than the developers of the computers that are trying to be resistant to the hacking. So I come from a long line of using the command line and that's why I encourage you to use the command line in this course. 
So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to go up into the application layer and instead of typing those commands by hand, we're going to actually send them from Python and write a very simple Python web browser. In this section, we're going to write a web browser using Python. So we've already got a socket. We know how to write a socket. In the previous section, we played with the protocol and used Telnet to do it by hand. And now we're going to do it in Python. And what you're going to find is it's not that hard. So here we go. So the first three lines of this program, import socket, make the socket. Remember, the socket isn't really got the connection. So when you make the socket, Again, we're going to make a stream-based socket, and it's suitable for going across the internet. The connection that is like ring, phone call, connect to data.pr4e.org and port 80. And so that basically says extend the socket across and connect to a web server. And so there's got to be a piece of software running, and this will blow up if the software is not running. Okay? So then, now we've got a phone. We've made a phone call. Now. Whether or not the remote side says hello or not is up to the application protocol. And in this case, the web servers say nothing and they wait for you to talk first. So we're the web browser in this case. And so we're going to talk first. And we know what, because we read the documentation, we know that we're going to send get blah, 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 space, blah, 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 HT1, and then two new lines. Return, return. Remember, you had to have a blank line. We'll talk a little bit about this encode. It's preparing the data to go across the internet. And then we say send it. And so this basically takes that little string and sends it across the network. And then this piece of software is waiting for it. And then the software goes and reads a file or does some other stuff. And then it starts sending us data back, which we can then choose to receive. So now I write a real simple loop. We're going to receive the first, we're going to receive these things 512 characters at a time. So we're going to loop through receiving 512 each time. And um, if we get uh, zero characters, that means it's end of the stream. The stream is closed. And if you look at the uh, little example from the previous one, you saw a connection closed. When the connection is closed, we get an indication that it is because we ask for some data and we get zero data. Otherwise, if there might be more data, this will wait. If the network is slow, you'll see, if you do a print statement in here, you will see that this will pause from time to time on a really slow network. If your network is fast, it'll just go blank and it'll be so fast it won't matter. But this is how we go. So this is basically until the entire uh, socket, until the, enti the socket is closed, we are going to read this data. And because this data is coming from the outside world, we have to decode it before we print it. And then when we're all done, we break out of here and we close the socket. So literally, that is an entire web browser written in 10 lines of Python. And again, this is why everybody loves Python. So this is what this program will show if you run. Um, the get is sent. It looks exactly like doing it by hand. Um, you get some headers. Again, this is metadata that tells you something about the file. In this case, one of the important things is what kind of thing is coming next. There's always a blank line between, as a break between the headers and the actual data, the metadata and the data. And then here is the actual text of that Romeo.txt file. And then it's going to run this, I'm going to print data.decode. All this is coming from the print statement. If you're going to parse this, you have to know that you're going to read the headers up to a blank line. The blank line is your indication as a software developer that the headers have stopped and the actual text begins, and you know the syntax. This actually could be a JPEG or a PNG or some kind of image, right? And this data would here look like blah. So if you type this and you change that code to actually talk go retrieve a JPEG URL, gibberish will come out, okay? Um, and so that's exactly what you will see. And so now you have built a very simple web browser. Next, I want to talk a little bit about the what happens when uh, characters transition out from outside your computer, I mean, from inside the computer in strings, out across these sockets to servers, and then back. Hello everybody and welcome to some worked sample code. If you are interested in the source code, you go to materials and uh, download this sample code.zip. I have this uh, downloaded. It'll be uh, in a folder called code three on my computer. This is where I'm at. I'm in the code three folder. And this has a ton of bits of code here. So if I do an LS, you'll see I got a, all these files here. And so um, 
We'll just leave those there. Um, and so this is the one I want to work through right now, is this socket1.py code. And um, basically what we're doing here is we're simulating uh, what is going to happen in a web browser. And the cool thing about the HTML, the HTTP protocol, is that we can, t we can do this by hand. And I'm actually going to hack this HTTP protocol. This is going to go to data.pr4e.org and retrieve a document. Um, and so I'm going to do telnet to, now you can do this on a Mac and Linux. And if you put telnet on a Windows box, you can do it here, data.pr4e.org. And I want to talk to port 80. And the port 80 is a different port. It's a non-standard port. But what we're doing here is talking to the HTTP port. And so I'm going to be able to hand send commands to the web server and retrieve a document. So I'm going to, I'm going to cut. I've already copied this string, this get HTTP Romeo.txt. I'm copying that into my buffer because if I wait too long, this won't work. So here I go, and now I'm going to type that, and I have to hit enter twice. And that literally was the HTTP protocol. The, what I typed there was the HTTP protocol. And the web server responds with some metadata about the document, um, how, many, how much data there is, the kind of data is there. Um, a blank line separates the header information uh, from the, the body of the document. If I was to go to this in a browser right there, you would see And if I turned on developer console and I went to the network, let's make this a little bit bigger, you would see that it retrieves this file romeo.txt and it gets back that it tells us, it shows us the headers and it shows us the response. And so this is all the same way of doing the same thing, and that is how to do the HTTP protocol. Okay? But now we're going to do this in Python. And so here's the code we're going to write. So we're going to import the socket library, and we're going to make a socket. Now this doesn't actually make a connection. Think of a socket as a file handle that doesn't have any data associated with it yet. And then what we're going to do is we're going to reach out and connect that socket to a destination across the internet with the domain name of data.pr4e.org. And the second parameter in this tuple, this this is a function call with a single tuple as a parameter. And so tuple sub 0 is data.pr4e.org, and tuple sub 1 is the 80, which says I want to talk to port 80. That could fail. Um, it will make the connection. And, um, and if the port 80 is there, away it goes. And then we're going to actually send the HTTP command. So get, this is the HTTP rules, followed by an end of line, followed by a blank line. So you saw me do this. There, This was what I typed here. And then I had to type a blank line. Now, if you want to go read the RFCs for how to do this, you can figure this out. So the only other thing that's kind of weird here is um, we have to add this dot in code. Um, and that's because there are strings inside of Python that are in Unicode. And we have to send them out as what's called UTF-8. And in code, converts from Unicode internally to UTF-8. So this command is a set of UTF-8 bytes that we're then going to send. It still has that same set of characters in it, um, and now we're going to send it. And that's after, after we've made the connection, we're going to send these two things, and then we're going to wait. And my, my sock is like a file handle at that point because it's been opened and we've sent data. The HTTP protocol told us what this we had to send and the fact that we did have to send it. So now I have just a simple while loop, and I'm going to ask up to 512 characters and you know, receive up to 512 characters and get that back. If I will know that this is the end of file if I got no data back. So if the length of the data, the byte array that I got back is less than one, then I'm going to quit. Otherwise, I'm going to print the data, and I'm going to use this decode, which is kind of the opposite of this encode. What I'm getting is UTF-8 encoded data, most likely. And decode basically converts it to the internal format called Unicode that runs inside. So this is going to run a bunch of times, pulling in the blocks, basically 512, up to 512 characters at a time, printing it out, and then when it's all said and done, we will close that connection. And so it's not too exciting. Python 3, socket 1.py. And you'll see that it's just going to, Python is now going to do what I did by hand. 
Now, of course, the interesting thing is these are all in strings, right? And so, um, you know, this way we could write code that does stuff with this. But all we're really trying to do in this particular situation is show how you open a socket, send a command, and then retrieve the data. Okay, so now it's time to teach you a bit of complexity about text processing. Up till now, we've kind of been ignoring the complexity of text processing. Um, everything that I have been doing, uh, most of what I've been doing is in ASCII, uh, the Latin character set, the character set that, uh, you know, United States, Europe, lots of Western uh, civilizations use this character set. And if you go back to the 1950s and 1960s, they, we were happy to have one computer and we didn't care what the character set was as long as what you typed on the keyboard came out on the printer, the internal representation uh, didn't matter. And as the 70s and 80s came along, certainly 70s, we needed some interoperability and so they standardized on a character set, but they standardized on a character set certainly in the West that did not represent anything. And so if you look at this uh, at, at this sheet, basically what it's telling you is for the various characters, um, there's some non-printing characters, white space, non-printing characters, and then here's some printing characters like the AND key, the zero, and then the uppercase characters, and then the lowercase characters, and there's 128 of these possible values. And there are nothing even for Spanish or French in here. And it's also why, by the way, Uppercase lower letters in Latin sort lower than lowercase letters, and we saw that in some of the string stuff. And what these do is it maps and says, okay, um, and a lowercase a maps to the number, integer number 97, which in base 16 is uh, 61, and in octal it's 141, but in binary, this is the, it's 8-bit numbers. And so these are 8 bits, otherwise known as a byte. And they're very efficient, like, you, you know, when you buy a, buy a disk drive, it's megabytes or gigabytes or whatever. That's how many of these kind of characters it can store. But unfortunately, this doesn't work for more complex characters. You can figure out these numbers inside of Python by, um, by using the ORD function. And so you say, what is the ordinal or the numeric representation of the uppercase H, lowercase e, and new line is a character as well. And so like 10 is the ordinal position of new line. And this actually has to do with sorting, so that E, lowercase e, is higher than uppercase H. And that's just because in the simplest of sorts, we just sort them numerically. So new line, if you go back to the previous little sheet, new line is this 10 right here. It's that 10, which is a line feed, and that's a 10. And that's why when we print new line out, we get a 10. And so again, we, in the early days when sim strings were simple, we just represented them as one byte per character. But the problem is, is that, you know, as we have gotten more complex and in today's modern world, it's simply unacceptable to say that the only thing computers can understand is ASCII. And so this leads to a very, very, from the simplest of character sets to a super complex character set called Unicode, which basically is billions of characters, potential billions of characters um, for every language and every character set. And because there's so much space in Unicode, it's easy to take very small variations of characters and give them a space. It's so large that you can have, um, uh, you, you, can ha you, you can have pretty much any character that you want. So that's Unicode. Um, the problem is, is that if we sent Unicode across the network, it would be way too large. It'd be this UTF-32, which instead of being eight bytes per character would be four bytes per character. And so it would take all of the data that we build and make it four times larger. And, and it'd be very difficult. And so what they've come up with is ways to compress this. Um, and UTF-16 is this weird thing. UTF-32 is really sort of the full Unicode, pretty much. UTF-16 is a subset of Unicode. It's, it's, it's used in some countries, but the best practice for moving data across the internet or in a file that you're gonna move between computers is what's called UTF-8. And so what happens is, is that UTF-32 is fixed length. ASCII, ASCII is one, one 
byte. UTF-16 is two bytes, UTF-32 is four bytes, and UTF-8 is dynamically, has dynamic length, meaning that it is one to four bytes, and if it's only one byte long, it's perfectly compatible with ASCII, meaning that an ASCII file is also a UTF-8. And so here's this little sheet, and it's not critical that you understand this graph too much, but basically, as time passed, 2000 internets coming, 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 now 2014, pretty much overwhelmingly the documents on the internet that you might retrieve are UTF-8. Now, so UTF-8 is the recommended practice and it's sort of a compression of UTF-8 can represent all the things UTF-32 can represent. It's just a compression of it so that and with an overlap of ASCII, which is awesome. It's what you want. I don't even talk anymore. So in Python, we have always had sort of uh, two ways of representing strings. In Python 2, uh, the normal string was a byte string, was an ASCII string, was a Latin string. And if you wanted to represent Unicode, there was a separate kind of object that we had. And, um, and so you would, you would do that. And um, in Python 3.0 or later, uh, one of the main features of Python 3 was to make Unicode and string the same. So that, that means inside of Python, when you have a string variable, it's a Unicode. Whereas inside of Python 2, it was a byte variable. And so now we have this notion separately in Python 2 and on Python 3, where we have byte variables. And so byte variables are, in effect, an array of bytes. So if there's three ABC, that means it's three bytes. It's three bytes long. Whereas a string might be three, a three character string might be th anywhere from three to 12 bytes long. So Python 2 had bytes and strings that were the same. Bytes and strings are the same and Unicode is weird. And in Python 3, strings and Unicode are the same and bytes are weird. Okay. And so that's that's what we've got to deal with. And there'll be times when we get bytes um, from uh, APIs, uh, when we call things, we have to then figure out what kind of thing those bytes contain, because the bytes might contain ASCII, they might contain UTF-8, they might contain various things. And so internally, all the strings in Python 3 are Unicode. Uh, most of the time, if you're inside the program or reading and writing files, we just work. And that's why we haven't mentioned it. But now that we're talking over sockets and we're talking to the sort of random world out there, we have to be a little more aware of the data we're dealing with. Now, the good news is 98% of the time or 95% of the time, um, it's UTF-8, which might also include ASCII. And so it's quite nice. But we have, to, we have to be aware of this. And so if we are going to take data that comes off of the network in the bytes, then we have to make sure that we interpret it or decode it and in the right way so that internally the strings, which are Unicode, are properly represented. And so that's why when we read data in from a network connection like a socket, we have to say, hey, decode it. Now there's a couple things going on at that moment of decode. Um, and so this is where we're doing it. We see this, we, we have to manage this in this code where we, before we send this stuff, we're going to encode it, which takes a, a Unicode string and turns it into UTF-8 bytes. There's actually a parameter here that you can do it different than UTF-8, but no one ever does. You might have to for certain situations, but so that says that we're going to encode this into UTF-8 before we send it. And then when we get something back, before we print it, we're going to decode it. And that's how this ends up working out. Um, and if you look at the documentation, you will see that sometimes it says it's a string or it's bytes. And so, uh, so the, you, you take a byte array and you decode it to get a string and you take a string and encode it to get a byte array. And so that's what we're doing. So you can think of the process as this way. And that is um, the network has these UTF-8 mostly UTF-8 resources, not ASCII. Um, if it's ASCII, it's okay. So you read with the receive. So this receive here pulls data, or well, let's, we have a Unicode string. We're gonna, let's start with the send. So up here, 
We have a Unicode string, that's a Unicode string, even though there's no special characters in it, no Asian characters or French characters, that's a, that's a, that's a Unicode string, and before we can send it, we have to send it in UTF-8. If that was, if that had Asian characters, it'd be okay, because, and that would be set up just right so that the UTF-8 would be right, so we encode it first, and that's the CMD. This is now bytes, okay, CMD is bytes, and then we actually send the bytes, and that goes across the network, we get back our thing, and we receive, and we receive into data. Well, data is bytes, not string. It's bytes. We can say how big it is. Functions kind of like a string, and it has len, except that it is one byte per character, which means some of it might be UTF-8. And then all we have to do is say decode. Again, you could, if you were dealing with a situation where you weren't expecting it to typically be UTF-8 or ASCII, you could tell it UTF-16 or something, and it's more complex, but the simple thing is to just say, I'm gonna clean up my data on the way in, I'm gonna clean it up by running it through decode, and I'm gonna encode stuff on the way out. And so sockets are the place where this comes into play. And so you'll see, we'll always do this encode and decode every time we're sending data kind of outside of Python and inside of Python. So now that we've talked a little bit about character sets, we're going to make this even easier um, so you don't have to use sockets. We're gonna, URL lib is a bit of Python uh, code in the library that does all the socket stuff for you. Okay, so now we're going to write a web browser again in Python, but it's going to even be shorter than what we did before. We did it in 10 lines using sockets. Now we're gonna do it in four lines with URL lib. So URL lib really, is just because the idea of opening a connection, sending a get request, sending the new line, retrieving the stuff, breaking the headers out, doing all this stuff, that's so common, why not put it in a library to save ourselves some effort? So here's how we do it. We're going to read it in, right? We're gonna import this library, so it's not part, of, we had to import sockets before, but we're gonna import urlib now. And so this is really quite simple. It's like elegantly simple. You say, URL lib, that's a library, that's a part of a library, a module within the library, and this is a function. So let's call URL open, and then give it the URL. Now that's a string which it's gonna encode automatically for us. So it's taking care of all kind of pretty things for us. It does the get, it does the encode. Look back at that previous code. That's kind of what URL lib is doing for us, okay? Now what URL lib also does is it makes the connection, encodes the get request, and then it actually retrieves at this moment, it retrieves all the headers and keeps them for you for later. You can get the headers, but we're not gonna see the headers. And it returns to you an object that looks pretty much like a file handle. Because you can put this in the for clause after the in. Now it's going to read, run that loop one time for every line of this file. And so the lines we're gonna get back are bytes, and so we have to say decode. It doesn't do that for us automatically. We are gonna to have to decode them, and that's because we might need to decode them with a particular character set here. And then we're gonna do our strip, and we're gonna just print this out. So that's just, that's like open a file, read through it, and print it. This is open a URL, read through, and print it. And that's as simple as it is. And so that's what happens. This is Romeo.txt, and it, does, it prints out. Now the thing to notice is that there are no headers here. The headers have been sort of consumed in the URL open. Again, there is a way to say, hey, give me my headers, but for now, this is just gonna eat the headers and keep them, and then you get to read all the data, and the loop runs, and this loop runs four times, and out come the four lines. You can go ahead and run this one. It's super easy. I mean, literally, super easy. And if you, you can do anything you want, I mean, treat it like a file. You just have to remember to do the decode bit uh, when you treat it like a file. And so we, that code import it. We're gonna open it. We're going to make a dictionary. We're gonna loop through. We're gonna split it. We have to add the decode just to make sure because that line is bytes, not string. And then we're gonna go, you know, our words. We're gonna go through the line and then each line we're gonna bounce through the words. The inner for loop is bouncing through the words and then we're gonna to go to the next line. And then we make ourselves, in this, a dictionary and we print that dictionary out. Now this is, this in effect, other than, you know, importing this, opening it differently and doing the decode, this is exactly how we would process a file. And so by using URL lib, you really sort of reduce the complexity of retrieving and reading network resources to the same complexity of reading and uh, dealing with a file locally on your hard drive, which is uh, kind of pretty. So, 
One of the things then we can do is read web pages. That was a text file, but this, you can get HTML. And so here's how you read a web page. And it's the same kind of code. We open a we open a, a URL. This one happens to have HTML in it, and we read through it, and out comes the HTML. Remember that the headers are there, but they've been eaten by URL open for us. And now we could write a browser that would parse these less thans and greater thans and make links, etc., etc., etc. So if you can come up with ways to find these links, you could actually write a bit of code that would then have a loop that would go up and open a new one. Pull out the links, open a new one. Pull out the links, open a new one. And so you could. You could make a thing that would retrieve a, you could write a program that would retrieve a, pro, a page, find the links in the page, and then retrieve those links. And we'll actually do that before the end of the class. And so Python is a very popular language at Google, and I wonder if they're, I'm going to, I think it's a pretty safe bet that the first crawler that they wrote to crawl the web to build the index was Python, because literally that's all it takes to read web pages and um, pull those web pages into your web crawler database. So I don't know, are those the first four lines ever written to Google? Who knows? So the next thing that we'll talk about is how you handle that HTML. Um, HTML is kind of yucky and nasty, and so it's not as simple as regular expressions. Regular expressions might help, string parsing and split might help, but it's just too crazy. So we'll talk a little bit about how to use a library to make HTML parsing a lot easier. We are going to be talking about uh, some code. If you want to download all the code, it's right here. Uh, it's all single big zip file. And um, you'll get, uh, all this sample code, the one I'm going to talk about is urllib1.py. It is uh, not very exciting. It's short. Um, that's what's kind of nice about uh, Python code. And it's really, if we go and take a look at the code we played with just previously, which is socket, um, the idea here is urllib is something that Python has produced for us to make socket communications and HTTP communications a lot better. So socket, what's it, this is making socket calls underneath it, but there's a library that makes this quite simple. And so we have to do some imports. So instead of importing socket, we'll import these URLs. We are going to create a handle. You are able to request URL open and just pass in a string. So we're not encoding this. We're not sending get command. All the stuff we did in the previous sockets example is gone. And then we can just put this as a for loop. And so we're not using this lower level read and write code. We're just using a for loop. And so that literally is going to read the text line by line. And the line does come back as an array of bytes. So we have to do a decode. But then we got a string. And then we can do a strip on it. So this is like a super simple, uh, super simple. So there we go. Now, the interesting thing is, is you also don't see the headers. We just read the contents. Now, it turns out in URL lib, and we'll see this in later more complex application, you can get the headers if you want. You can get uh, various other things. So that's URL lib, a simple URL lib tool. Um, now, we can also use this in URL words to, to, to show you something quite interesting, and that is, if you look at this from right here, other than the decode, this is exactly the code we wrote to compute the words, right? So line, other than this line.decode, this is just a open something up. In this case, we're going to open a URL. We're going to create a dictionary. We're going to loop through each of the lines in that thing. We're going to decode them and then split them. So once you do line.decode, this is now a legitimate internal Python string. We split it. We run through the words and run the counts. And so this is exactly like code that we did before to run counts. And so Python 3 URL words. And so that gives us a dictionary, which is the word frequency. And we could do all kinds of crazy stuff in here, you know, with uh, sorting and all the kinds of things. The important thing is once you've done this and this, the code, other than the need to decode these lines when you first get them, um, it really works just like makes a URL lib makes URLs function inside Python very much like files. So these are short, short and to the point and very simple, and I hope that they were useful to you. 
So now we're going to talk about what you would do with a web page once you've retrieved it in a Python program. Call this web scraping. And so web scraping or web spidering is the act of retrieving a web page, extracting the links from those web page, making a queue of unretrieved links, and then moving on. And eventually the idea is if you had enough time, energy, bandwidth, and storage, you could find your way to most of the web pages on the internet that are pointing, that point, point to or are pointed to by other web pages. And so you might have all kinds of reasons to scrape data. You might have a blog that you uh, posted. You might have, um, who knows, maybe you put some data in a system. Maybe, uh, maybe the system's being shut down because it's being uh, retired. You can do all kinds of things. Um, you could write a little thing. I was talking to somebody who wrote a thing to retrieve something and check and then send a text when something changed. All kinds of stuff. Or you might make yourself a search engine. But uh, be careful. Not all websites are happy about you uh, using a robot to retrieve their content. Uh, some of the websites, as we'll see, you demand that you log in and they track what you do. And if they think you're doing something bad, they will shut your account off. Uh, other websites will track what you're doing without you logging in, but then shut your address off. And, uh, and so you have to be careful. You should read up. You should figure out what sites allow you to scrape them. Now, I have some sites that I've set up that you can play with to make it so that it's a um, legit. So parsing HTML is difficult. You, some of the simple examples, you know, you could probably write a regular expression or, you know, certainly some splitting and some whatever. And what you would find is you would write that code and you'd retrieve your first five web pages and it would seem to work. And then it would encounter some really weird but legitimate HTML or maybe even sort of slightly broken HTML. So the web is full of broken HTML and your browsers just look at it and go like, oh wow, more broken HTML. But they don't put up error messages and so people just leave broken pages up. But your Python program is gonna see those broken pages. So what you would do is you'd be like, oh, here's a new weird way to do an anchor tag. I'll change my code. Oh, and then run for another 100 pages and like, oh no, here's a new weird way to do an anchor tag. And the problem is, is that you're going to find a lot of different ways to mess up an anchor tag. And someone has already done that. There's a software called Beautiful Soup, um, and we have installation instructions on how to use it. And really what it is, is it's somebody just spent months figuring out all the nasty things that could happen and compensated for it and gave you a nice wrapped interface that just says, look, you give me the HTML and I'll give you back the tags. Okay. And so it's called Beautiful Soup. And so you have to install this. There's a couple of ways that you can install this. If you're good at extending your Python, you can just, you know, extend and install Beautiful Soup for all Python programs. If you can't change your, your com computer's configuration because you're on a school computer or you're using a USB stick or something, then there's a way to download this file that I've created called bs4.zip. And so what you do is you end up with your file called, you know, URL links. Dot .py and then a little folder called bs4 which is a folder that has a bunch of files in it from the zip file and then you can run it and so it'll pull it in and you'll import from bs4 beautiful soup and that's either going to pull it in from the folder you do or if you have installed it using the python installer um, it will also just you don't have to put this file in so it's up to you you can either do it one of two ways so this is a little bit of code. Now, Beautiful Soup is a complex uh, library, and so just because this looks easy, you, doing things in Beautiful Soup, you might have to actually you know, read a bit more to figure it out. But we're going to just read this. We're going to um, uh, import Beautiful Soup. We're going to ask for a URL right here. We are going to take that URL. We're going to open it. URL open. They give the URL and read the whole thing. That means we're not writing a loop. We've read the whole thing. That's okay as long as you know that the file's not so large. And then we're going to pass the data we got back. And this is going to be bytes, but Beautiful Soup knows all about bytes and all about UTF-8, and it figures that out. And you just say, hey, take that stuff I just got and tear it apart using HTML and give me back an object, a soup object. Now, the soup object is something that you can run queries against. So it parses it, it deals with all the imperfections and inconsistencies in this, this HTML byte array. Um, and it fixes that and gives that back. And so there's various things you can do and you gotta go look at the Beautiful Soup documentation. It could be a whole class on Beautiful Soup. So here's a thing you can do is this object 
you can sort of call it like a function um, and say, hey, give me back the anchor tags. And anchor tags, of course, are the tags that say href equals blah, 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 slash a. So all of this is an anchor tag. And then we're going to loop through the tags because there could be more than one of those anchor tags in the file. And then we're going to pull out that href. And that's what this does. We're going to loop through all the tags and print out the href. So if you tell it to go to drchuck.com, it will show you the one external link in drchuck.com. And so uh, I've got an assignment that sort of goes into that in some more detail. Um, but this chapter has been uh, a whole bunch of interesting stuff. We started with the TCP IP model and talked about sockets that are phone calls between computers and then how applications, uh, uh, protocols are developed to say what we say on those phone calls. And we've explored then the HTTP protocol, which is probably the most likely thing you're going to see. And then we played with all this in Python and saw that uh, Python is really good at this. Uh, you can write extremely simple and small programs to do some extremely complex and powerful things. And again, that's why people like Python is because uh, it makes the complex uh, simple. We're going to do a little bit of sample code. If you're interested in getting the sample code, you can download this zip here at pythonforeverybody.com materials.php and you will download and you will get all the files um, and all the files that I'm looking at here. And so the one I'm going to play with today is the file called urllinks.py. So the first thing you got to do before urllinks.py works is you have got to install beautiful soup. And I've got some simple instructions at the beginning of the file. And so one way to do it is install it using um, Python install process to install this beautiful soup for all Python applications. And if you are the owner of your computer and you're going to use beautiful soup a lot, it's a fine idea to do that. But I want to show you a simpler way that if you don't own your own computer and you just want to make it so that beautiful soup works, um, you can download this file, um, this file right here, beautiful soup. 4.zip, unzip it, and put it in the same folder as here. And so if you look in this folder, I have a subfolder called BS4, and that's the unzipped version of this. And it has these things. I didn't write this code, so I'm sorry if the name is bad, but the, this is the code to BS4, and this is what's in BS4.zip, and it's in the same folder as urlinks.py. And so what happens is, is when you do this from BS4 import beautiful soup, that either can go to sort of this global magic place that Python installs stuff and pulls in the beautiful soup object, or it can go to the folder BS4 and pull it in. Okay? And so that's how that works. So you have to do one of these two things. I prefer to keep it simple, download and unzip this file and put it in the same folder as, um, as this code, and away you go. So from the previous example, we're going to use URL lib, of course, and then we're going to pull in the beautiful soup from the beautiful soup for library. We're going to get the beautiful soup object. Now, if you do this with SSL, if these websites we're going to play with have SSL, you pretty much have to do this little hack. And these three lines, don't worry too much about it. The whole idea, you can do Google on Stack Overflow and figure this out. But this is the way that you ignore errors when you have SSL certificate errors. Um, and so we have to add this parameter context equals CTX, which is this variable that we create. So this part and this part sort of just do them. If you don't, you can take them out actually, um, but otherwise you won't be able to do HTTPS sites. So let's take a look at what we're doing other than uh, dealing with the HTTPS problem. Um, going to ask the user for a URL. We are going to um, <coughs> retrieve all the HTML. We're going to do a URL open just like we did before. Now this would return us something we could loop through line by line with a for loop, but instead we're going to say, hey, read the whole thing. And that basically returns us the entire document at that web page um, in a single big string with new lines at the end of each line. And this is not an Unicode, but it's probably a UTF-8 string. But it turns out Beautiful Soup knows how to deal with UTF-8, and it also knows how to deal with Unicode strings. So what we're saying is Beautiful Soup read through and deal with all the nasty bits, right? So HTML is like very, very flexible. 
So drchuck.com slash page one htm. And so if we take a look at the source of this, view page source, make this bigger, you know, you might be able to do regular expressions, but do, it does things like break stuff across lines. There could be a line break here. There could be all kinds of things, right? And so writing, you know, regular expressions or splits or whatever is really hard for HTML. And so what we do is we, someone has written this. It's called Beautiful Soup. And it's basically, this is the code, and it's, it's based on a, a joke from a children's story. Um, it, it basically, someone has just went through and figured out all the bad things that could possibly happen when you're reading and parsing uh, HTML. So either you use it or you will slowly but surely derive all the things that it doesn't work. And so <clears throat> when we look at this line right here, this line at a high level is saying, we're giving you ugly, nasty HTML that could make no sense whatsoever. Please read it and have all the brains that you have and all the weird stuff, figure that out for us and give us back an object. I happen to call it soup. You don't have to call it soup. An object, and that is a proxy for that HTML, but this soup object is clean. And so what we can do is we can sort of retrieve all the anchor tags. So we can talk to this object and say, ask it, give me the anchor tags. What's an anchor tag? Well, if we take a look at this source, the anchor tag is the A through the slash A. That is the tag. It is the tag. It is attributes that are on the tag. It is the text within the tag and everything. And so that's what we're going to get. Now, I, I called it tags plural, not because plural matters at all, but because we're going to get a list of tags. Because even though this web page has lots and lots of tags, if we look at, say, drchuck.com, and view source, whoa, that's kind of small. View page source, right? and we go look for sla uh, a anchor tags, we got 45 of them, and they all kind of have weird stuff in them, right? So this line will give us back a list of tags. It will give us all the tags in this document. So it goes, the tag goes from there to there. And then what we're going to do is going to write a loop to loop through all the tags. So that's basically hopping, like it's hopping through the document, sort of like this. That's what it's doing. Hop, 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 hop. And it's pulling out the text of the href attribute, so it's going to talk, uh, pull out this bit right here. Oh, whoops. Oh, darn. That was so cool, because that's a flaw. Look at that. This is my own page. There is no closing quote here, but it's going to work, because HTML soup is like, oh, I know what to do about that. I can deal with that. So let's check to see if that one works, because that's like a mistake. But that's one of the things we like about beautiful soup. So we're going to read through, and then we're going to pull out all the hrefs. So... <laughs> This is probably thousands of lines of code that you really don't want to run. So Python 3 URL links dot py. And so let's start with a simple one, http colon slash slash www.drchuck.com. And it reads it. Oh, that's a, no, that's, that's actually the card one because we got a whole bunch. Let's see if Sugi, see the Sugi one worked. It found that one. It's right after sakaiproject.org. Where is that? Is there another Sugi? Oh, no, I didn't find that one. That's kind of funky. Look, it found it wrong, but that's okay. So you see it found all these and did a lot of nice stuff for us. If we do it, Python 3 URL links .py and do the easy one. It used to be colon slash slash dub 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 dr dash chuck.com page one dot htm we will only see one and there we go now the uh, the SSL is if you are looking at a page that has uh, SSL Python URL links to so I'll go to like HTTPS colon www.si.umich.edu and that will get a bunch of links. And so you'll see if it wasn't for that, so all kinds of stuff coming back. And if it wasn't for this bit right here and this bit right here, this HTTPS wouldn't have worked. And it's not that that website had a bad URL. It has, um, it has a, a certificate that's not in Python's official list. 
Um, and so the, the URL is okay. So that gives you a uh, quick uh, summary of uh, using the beautiful soup library in Python along with the URL lib. Hello and welcome to Chapter 13, Web Services. So what we've been doing so far is we've been using the request response cycle. We've le learned about sockets, we've learned about URL lib, and we've actually learned how to pull HTML and even flat text uh, off the internet. But what we're going to talk about now is using that same request response cycle to, to retrieve information that is specifically designed for programmatic consumption. So that you know, we had to have this beautiful soup, which sort of did a hack job or hard solve the hard problem of parsing HTML. But why not produce data in a format that makes good sense to a program because programs want to talk to each other? If you recall, the whole idea of a socket is to have one application process sending data to another application process. And so if we, if we think about this for a moment and we realize that we have all these prog programs, they could be written in different programming languages and they're all connected. And so they might want to send data back and forth uh, through the network. PHP programs, JavaScript programs, Java programs. And so we have to decide on a protocol that is independent of any programming language. And then we call that the wire protocol because if you were to sort of take some connection and watch the exact characters that go back and forth, that's what you would see if you were monitoring the wire. So that's why we call that the wire protocol. And so the idea is, is that we have to agree on a format that is going to represent the data and we can't make it a, a Python specific format or a Java format. And when we take the data from the internal representation, maybe a Python dictionary, to send it to the wire, we call that act serialization. And that is going from sort of the internal representation to the serial representation or the wire representation. And then here is an example of a person with a name and phone number with using less thans and greater thans. This is an XML example. And then in the far end, in a different programming language, it receives this and then deserializes it and then turns it into some useful structure inside that programming language. And so this is an example of a wire protocol that's using XML. And that's one of the formats we're going to talk about. Another format that we're going to talk about is a format called JSON, JavaScript Object Notation. And it is simpler and easier, but it's not as uh, precise and descriptive as XML is. And so while you'll find that most of the things you run into, especially if you're talking to APIs of one form or another, you'll find that JSON is very common. XML still uh, holds sway in places like documents. So if you look at docx at the end of a Microsoft Word document, docx means that it's an XML version of the representation of a word processing document. So the first thing we'll talk about is XML. So one of the two ways that we mark up data is XML, the other is JSON. First we'll talk about XML. We'll talk about XML more for a longer time than we talk about JSON. XML stands for Extensible Markup Language. Um, there was a number of markup languages in the 90s that were out there, ways to send data between computers. And um, none of them was like amazingly better than the other, but in the late 1990s, early 1990s, as HTML came out, the idea that we could use less thans and greater thans, you know, or, or angle brackets, some people call them. Um, uh, once HTML made angle brackets popular as a representation format, uh, it was pretty natural that we would find a data representation format that would take a similar approach. And um, so inside XML, we're going to talk about tags, we're going to talk about attributes, we're going to talk about data, and we've already talk about, talked about serialization and deserialization. Serialization is the act of taking data inside of a computer in one programming language, setting it up for transport, transporting it across, and then taking it back apart and turning it back into the data in uh, whatever internal data it needs to be in the destination system. So here is some basic XML, so we can take a look at the various things that make up the XML. So it's very much like HTML in, in that we have tags, less than, greater than. The difference is we get to name the tags anything we want, rather than the, the A tag, or the P tag, or the H1 tag. And there is a beginning tag and an ending tag, and they're bracketed together, and there are syntax errors in XML. Syntax errors in XML are more severe than syntax errors in HTML. Um, it's supposed to be right, and um, if you send bad XML, it's likely that the far end will not understand it. 
Um, so we have a beginning tag and ending tag, and so like name and slash name are a beginning and ending pair. Then there is the actual textual content, and that is the material between it. Uh, and then here's a phone and slash phone, and we have this thing called the attribute. Key equals value. Uh, the key doesn't have double quotes. The value always has double quotes. And this is this is like href equals on um, on an anchor tag. And sometimes you have what's called a self-closing tag, where you don't actually have a closing tag. You have all the data that you need in the attributes, and so you don't even bother putting an empty text area in in a closing tag. So that is a start tag, an end tag, uh, attribute, and then a self-closing tag. Those are some basics uh, of XML. In general, XML doesn't care too much about white space. Um, it does in the text areas, so in here it matters, and here it matters, but things like we can indent this a little bit differently, and we tend to indent it in a way to make it look reasonable. Although once you have programs sending it back and forth, they tend to send it uh, more compacted uh, just for efficiency purposes. So one of the concepts is that there is a hierarchical structure within an XML document, and there are parent nodes and child nodes, and you can think of these as simple nodes that is, is a tag in some data, or a complex element that has a tag that includes other tags, some child tags. And there's a couple of different ways we can take a look at this. The, the simple and more natural way to think about this is a tree with parent-child relationships. So here we have this A tag on the outside, and that's the top level one. You can only have one outer tag, and you, can only, you can't have you know, another tag down here. So you have to have one tag that's sort of the root tag for X, everything in this XML document. And it has two children. So the, the C tag and the B tag are two children. So the B tag is a child of A. And then C has a D and an E tag that are children there. And then the, the textual data we model as a, ta as a child of each of those tags. And, so the, and you'll see in a bit why it's best to do that. So that is the way to think about this to, as a tree, to represent that XML as a tree. If we add attributes to it, and this is where you kind of see why it's nice to take the text area and make that be a child of the node, an attribute is a different. So the text is a special kind of child, and you can literally have more than one attribute. You could have x equals two, you know, zap equals whatever, and these could have a couple of different attributes. The, the w attribute is a value of five, and that's the five down there, and so you could have multiple ones. You can only have one text node. Now, in the case of a, you have a whole bunch of text nodes, but these are because there are ch child nodes. Uh, within one simple node, you can only have one text element. You can also think of XML as paths, and the easiest way is to sort of look down this tree version and look at from the path from the parent. So you go to A, then the parent, the child B, and then X. So at position AB, you find X. So AB is the path up to the root. So ACD, that's this one, is the path to Y, and ACE is the path to Z. And so you can think of these as paths. Um, part of what we're doing is we're coming up with ways to walk through and parse uh, trees of XML data. So the next thing we'll talk about is how we determine if a particular XML document is legal or uh, meets the contracts that two applications have set up. We're going to do a little bit of code. If you want to get your hands on the code, go to the materials uh, website, uh, materials.php, actually uh, materials.php, and uh, download the sample code. Um, the code that we're going to work on today is the XML code, and uh, we need to be able to talk XML uh, to work with web services. And so here's one of the examples from the book. It's xml1.py. And so later we'll be pulling uh, XML and JSON from the web, but for now we're just going to put it in a triple-coded string, uh, so data. And we're going to use a built-in XML parser in Python called element tree. And when we say import XML eTree element tree as ET, this as ET gives us basically a, uh, a shortcut handle for it. And so the idea, this is a string. It has less thans and greater thans. It looks like structured information, and it is. But really, at this point, it's only a string. Now, we have to call this et from string to read this and give us back a tree object. And what it does is this might blow up. This code might blow up right here if there was a mistake in it. Okay, and um, 
Matter of fact, I can probably put a mistake in. Let's see if I can delete this and save it and run this code, and we'll see that it will blow up. Right? And so it blew up here in line 8. Element tree blew up. In, or in, I mean, it, it blew up in line 12 of the code, which is right here. This failed because the line 8 of the XML string was wrong. So let's put the slide, uh, that back in. So now it's properly formed XML. So this tree we get back, I name it tree just because I always name it tree, but you could name it X. So the key is, is tree.find goes and looks for a tag named find. And it, it tree is no longer got less thans and greater thans in it. It is went and, uh, and turned this into objects within objects within objects. So tree find name says, I would like to find the tag name. And that's what this bit is right here. And then .txt.txt is going within that and grabbing that text, OK? And if we say tree find dot email, then that's going to give us this. And then that's that object. And then dot get asks for the contents of the hide attribute, which is the string yes. OK. And so if we run this, now that it's fixed, python 3 xml onepy it will pull in and get the, at the name and the attribute. So it's, it pulled the chuck out. And so you get this object, and then you kind of dive into that object. And so that's xml1.py. If you've got a tag, you can either get the text out of the tag, or you can get an attribute out of the tag. So now let's take a look at xml2.py. Again, we import element tree, and we have a tag. And there's XML's always got to have a single outer tag. But this time we're going to have, in effect, a list. Um, now let's, let's line this up a little better. There we go. That looks a little prettier. Um, and so users, not the, the fact that it's users doesn't mean anything, but we often uh, come up with semantically meaningful names for these things. Users is going to have it as its children a list of user tags. Okay, so the children under user, users uh, user under user, and then this has each of these as a tag. So we want to parse this, and this is a common thing we want to do. Um, you know, and so again, the first thing we do is we read the string to just take this. It's a triple quoted string going from here to here. And then we're going to, instead of doing find, which gives us one tag, we're going to do find all the users tag, the user tag that is a child of users. And we get back a Python list of the tags, not of the text, but of the tags. So there's a one tag and there is another tag. And so we can do len of that. So we can see that we got two. And then we can write a for, for loop. And the, this item is going to iterate through the tags that are the user tags that are children of users. So the first time item is going to be this tag, a tag, remember. And then the second time it's going to be this tag. And so we can do things like find and, and get, just like we did with the in XML1. So running this is not too exciting. Python 3, XML2.py. You see that there are two users that comes from this print right here. There are two users in there. And the first one, if we go into name and we go find the text within the name tag within user, then we get Chuck and we get the ID, which is 001. So we find the ID within that item and then we get the text. And then we look and we grab the X attribute um, off of that. And so we see Chuck Chuck 001 and 2, and then the, in the next tag, we the for loop continues, and we print that out. Okay, and so that's just a basic run through of the the XML from uh, the the, chap the chapter in the Python book. Okay, thanks. So now we're going to talk a little bit about XML schema. XML schema is a language that allows you to decide on whether or not a particular XML document meets a contract, an arrangement. So you have two pieces of software exchanging data using XML. And what if one of them, if they're all working, nobody really worries too much about it. But if all of a sudden one breaks, you change one side and the other one breaks, whose fault was it, right? Was it the side that got changed or the other side? And so you could argue. 
So what you tr like to do is before you set up these arrangements between these applications, set up a contract. In a way, they're kind of like the RFCs are, except that their scope is between pairs of applications. And so it, is, it itself is XML. And um, it, it basically, what we do is we, we take an XML document and an XML schema contract, and then we either say that's good or that that is bad. And that's called validation. A piece of software that validates XML when given a schema is called a validator. And so an XML document, here we have our little XML document, we're passing it to the validator. And then we have a schema contract, which is a itself XML, it's kind of a particular kind of XML, that XS colon complex type. That's just a tag, colon is a legitimate character for the name of a tag. Name equals person, that's just an attribute. And so XML schema is a particular format of XML that, a lot, that, that renders an opinion about what XML is supposed to look like. So there's a number of different XML schema languages. The one we're going to look at is one that's kind of came a little bit later, that's very common, um, called XSD, which is the World Wide Web Consortium's uh, schema specification. Often you'll find files that have suffixes of .xsd that actually contain the XML, just like we're going to show you. So if you recall, there are simple elements which have text children, um, and then there are complex elements where other, other no nodes are, are children of other nodes. And so we can say this, and so here we have a little bit of XML and the XML schema that makes sense with that. So um, what we're saying is the outer tag of this legitimate XML is supposed to be a complex tag with a name of person. And so there we go, that looks good, good, good. Then there is a sequence, and then there is a simple element, a name of last name, looks good, and it's a string, that looks good. Uh, uh, another tag that's of, in it, of, ty of a named age that's of type integer, that's good. And then a, a thing that's called date born, and then there it looks like a date. So we check all these things, and we can basically say, yup, you know, that is a good XML document according to this schema. And you don't have to write this generally, but there is software that reads these two things and comes back with a true or a false and might even have some detail as to what went wrong uh, with this particular schema. Here's some more that you can do with a schema. Um, we can do things like, you know, have a complex type, we have a sequence. Here we have a string, full name, and a string, child name but we have this min occurs and max occurs. So min occurs is the minimum number of times it can occur and maximum is the maximum. So min occurs equals one, max occurs equals one means it's required. And so this is required and we don't have two of them. Two of them would be an error. One of them is fine, so that's good. Here the child name is uh, min occurs zero, max occurs 10. So we have four here and so that's good too. And so that is another kind of XML schema constraint that you can have. Here's a few other data types that we can do. Uh, we've done the string, we've done the date. The date looks like this. Dates are uh, four digit year, two digit month, two digit uh, day with dashes. Now there's lots of different ways to represent dates, but the nice thing about this, and you, don't, you have to put the zeros in, so zero, 09 for September. Um, it means that these are sortable as strings, so that if you do all your dates this way, they're sortable as strings. So you could argue what is prettier, but for computers we don't worry about that. We're arguing about what's the most functional. And then the date time is that same date format with zeros, followed by the letter T, letter T, and then followed by hours, minutes, seconds, zero filled, right? So nine o'clock is um, zero nine and then the time zone, which we'll talk about a second in the next slide. You can have decimal numbers and you can have integer numbers as well. And so we are able to sort of render an opinion as to what is good and what is bad in the resulting XML. So dates are kind of interesting. There's, again, we have lots of different formats of dates, you know, nine, 10, you know, nine slash 10 slash 2002, right? Um, you know, that's a, that's a format of a date, but that's that's one. There's another another format of the date, which is, you know, 12 December, two, whatever. And so this is how people show dates. Computers don't want to have all those different dates and don't want to figure those out. They have libraries that produce dates and make them look pretty and for particular locales. But 
Computers really want dates that work best for them. So we just say, okay, we're gonna have this year, month, day, time, and then zero fill, hours, minutes, seconds, H, M, S, and then time zone. Now, computers even prefer a time zone. Now, if you, I don't know if you've used something like your Google Calendar and you take a flight or take a train trip and you end up in a different time zone, everything switches. And that's because Google Calendar is not really storing the time zone that you're, it's store, not storing the dates relative in your current time zone, it's storing them in what we call universal time or Greenwich Mean Time. Zulu time is another word for that. And Z means this time that is the time in, you know, London, England, Greenwich Mean Time. Um, and so the thing is, is that that means if this data moves between time zones or crosses the international date line or standard data like savings time or anything like that, none of that changes. And so, so we have this internal date and time that's very common in situations where computers are exchanging data that then gets shown with a time zone converted to the time zone or the local format that's the right way to do that. And there's a standard for how dates and times are supposed to look. So here's another little example of uh, some, some stuff. Let's see what we got. Now, if you see this little question mark XML, that's not a problem. That just is a way of sort of putting a header on the whole document that says it's an XML document, telling it that it's a UTF-8 document. Um, and that, that, that's not really a tag, that's sort of like a marker on the file, so that you can put that there, but it doesn't harm the XML. The outer tag is this tag right here, excess debt colon schema. And then um, what else we got? We got an address, we've got a string, 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 we've seen all those. Um, here we have country, and we're gonna have a restriction that basically says, this is a simple string, but we're going to make it so that you have to list one of these four as the country code. And so here we are down here, and that's UK, and that's UK, and so that is a valid XML. Another couple of examples here. Uh, let's see, uh, string, 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 string. Uh, Max Kerr's unbounded, that means infinite number. There's no limit on the number, you can do that. Uh, Min occurs of zero. Excess positive integer, we've, we've seen integer, but you can also say it's gotta be a positive integer. Uh, decimal, we've seen that. And then use equals required is just another statement that you can make. I'm not trying to get you uh, to the point where you can do XML schema, just get you a sense of the kinds of statements that we can uh, speak about when we're talking about what is and is not legitimate XML. So let's talk a little bit about how we might talk XML inside Python. And so, like most things that are in this extended part of Python, we have to import something. And so this is the name of a library, XML, eTree, element tree. And then as ET, this ends up being a shortcut. So we don't have to type these long things. And so ET is the same as typing that. It's almost like a macro. Now, normally this XML is gonna come somewhere from the network, but I'm just gonna put this in a string. I'm using a triple quoted string. And so that means that this triple quoted string starts here and ends here, and all these new lines that are here are actually part of the string. So this is kind of like I opened a file and read the whole thing in. But just to keep this totally self-contained, I'm putting it in a string. So the XML would come from some server on the other side of the network, we would get this XML. So that's, that's how it would normally work, okay? So this is the XML right there, and we parse a string of data and we call et from string. So we're passing in the less thans, the new lines, the greater thans, all of this stuff we're passing it in. And this could have syntax errors in it. So this might blow up if this had a syntax error, like we forgot the little slash or something, there was a syntax error. But this doesn't have a syntax error. So then what we do is we get back an object. I just happen to call it tree because it kind of is like that tree version of the XML. That is an object that we can then query to pull data out of it. So we say tree.find and look for a tag name name. So that finds the tag name name is this. It's, it's everything. It's the tag and the text. If we want the text, we add dot text. And then that dot text, that dot text, that actually refines it to only the word Chuck. And Similarly, if we do tree.find email, that tree.find email, 
that finds the email tag, which is this tag. It has a child attribute, and you can get any of the attributes. You say .get. There's only one text child, but there are many uh, attribute children, and so you have to tell it which one you want. And so this uh, this this here, this bit right here, all of that will reserve will resolve down to that string. Yes, that's what you're going to get there. Yes, and so you you kind of build up these little finds and call methods. This is not a clearly a full uh, introduction to element tree, but you get the idea that you sort of dive down in with these methods that call methods that call methods to get little pieces out and parse all of that. Here is a different example. In this one, again, we're using triple quoted string. We always have a single tag on the outside, and then I have a complex type of users, and in it there are two user objects. So this is kind of like a list. Right, so this is more than one of these things. So this user can occur more than one time. Um, <clears throat> and again, we take this, we pass that into from string and get back an object that represents the name stuff does not necessarily have to uh, be the same as this outer tag, uh, just a variable. This could, that could just, just as be easily as X if I wanted. And so now what I'm gonna say is, hey, hey stuff, I wanna find the tag, the path, user slash user, I want to find all tags that match user slash user. So that's going to give me a list of two tags, one tag, two tags in a list. Tag, tag. Oops. So two tags. Now I can print out how many I get. That'll be two in this case because I got two tags. And then I can actually iterate through the list. All right, so I can, I can iterate through the list. So this item is going to iterate first to this tag, and that tag, now, it's like, it's like in the previous example, we can look for the name tag within there and pull the text out. So we pull that text out, find the name tag, find the name tag, and then within that, find the text. And we can find the uh, ID tag and pull the text of that out. So that pulls out this 001, and uh, I've scribbled too much. And then we can item, which is, this is item, is that whole tag, dot get x. So that gets the attribute, that gets the two, that two comes down here, okay? And then item goes to the next one, because item is looping through, so item iterates down to that one and pulls out the name dot text, the id dot text, and the attribute dot x and pulls all those pieces out. So this is the basic pattern. You saw one where you just you're tearing into a single um, a single thing, and here you're tearing into something that is expected to occur uh, more than one time. And so that's a quick summary of how you talk to XML in Python. Up next, we're going to talk about the other serialization format, JavaScript object notation. So now we're going to talk about the other serialization format, JavaScript object notation. Chances are good, as you go out there, you will very likely encounter more JSON than you will XML. Not that XML is bad. XML is better for rich and hierarchical documents, whereas JSON is best for just pulling data out of a system and moving it between two systems with the minimum of fuss. Um, this is Douglas Crockford. Uh, I have a great interview from him. He's a funny guy, very, very smart. Um, he claims he didn't invent JSON, he discovered it because it really is based on the literal notation for JavaScript. And it actually looks a lot like the Python literal notation for objects and for lists. Now, Douglas Crockford is a, quite a sense of humor. Uh, he wrote this book called JavaScript, The Good Parts. That's the little one right there. And then JavaScript, The Comprehensive Guide in the the sense of humor is all the stuff that's in JavaScript that's not too useful. And while this is sort of a tongue-in-cheek, it also is trying to say that JavaScript, what Crockford is really saying here is JavaScript is a great language as long as you avoid the tricky bits and sort of keep it very, very simple. And JavaScript is indeed a great language. But, but JSON comes from JavaScript. You can read about JSON at json.org. Uh, JSON is not a international standard. It's not like an RFC. It really is. Douglas Crockford decided to register JSON.org and typed in some pages and people started reading it and people started using it. And partly that was because it was truly derived 
from the JavaScript, uh, note, uh, JavaScript literal syntax. So we're all ready to code. Here is some Python that's going to process some JSON. Keep it straight. Python process JSON. So again, I'm using the triple quoted string here. Now you'll notice the syntax that we are using is not uh, angle brackets, but instead curly braces. And so the curly brace, and then within the curly brace, you have key value pairs, name, colon, chuck, and the key, colon, value. And both sides have quotes. You can also have objects within objects, curly brace, key value pairs, key value, key value. Looks a lot like Python. And then you can do this. And so this is a structure that has one key value pair that's a string, another key value pair that's an object, another key value pair that's an object, and then these are key values within those contained objects. So this is a string that again probably was retrieved across the network from some other place. And we're going to pass that string into you know, the JSON library load S. Load S stands for load from string. So it reads this, parses it, looks at all the white space. White space again doesn't matter too much here unless it's in between double quotes. The white space doesn't matter and so it parses it and then returns us a dictionary. So the thing that's different about JSON um, is that its structure and representation are simpler than XML. So in, in Python, everything either comes back as a dictionary or a list, or a dictionary within a dictionary, or a list within a dictionary, but it's all dictionaries. It's not a separate structure that you have to do gets and finds and find alls and lookups. So it's right there. So when we get this back, because this is a curly brace, info is a dictionary. And so we can just use the standard syntax of Python, info sub name. Well, that will bring, let's, let's clear this. So info sub name, we'll, we'll go find Chuck. So if you compare that with the XML, that's just a lot easier. Now, when we have info sub email, that's this thing. So info sub email is that thing. And then sub hide is this. So that's what comes out here. Okay, so it's really uh, nested dictionaries and lists. We, we haven't seen a list yet, but this is a set of nested dictionaries that it, it parses. And it's equally simple in other programming languages. This is a little more complex version where the outer element is a, a, a square bracket, which means it's going to be a list. And so we have a list of one comma two things. So this is a list of two dictionaries. So there's two dictionaries inside that list. So again, we take this string and we load it into, uh, you use the JSON parser to read the string and give us back, in this case, info is a list. It's got two items. If we print out info, it'll get a, give us two. And we're going to iterate through. And so if we're going to iterate through, item is going to, is going to first be this, and then it's going to iterate to this. And it's going to print out item sub name, which is going to print out Chuck, item sub ID, which is going to print out uh, 001. Now you'll notice that there is no attributes. And that's because it, JSON is simpler. But we can have the X just as another item. So we say item sub X, and that's going to print the two out. And then it'll iterate to the next one, and it'll print out the same thing for those guys. And so JSON is simpler because it is you can't represent a, as complex a data structure or you have to compromise and map it into a simpler data structure but then it is lists and dictionaries and so once you've got it parsed it is easier to understand and to make use of. So that was quick. So that's part of, part of why everyone likes JSON better is once you have come up with a format that you're going to send it back and forth it's easy to make it and it's easy to read it. Now what we're going to talk about is sort of moving up a level. If you've got all these data formats and URLs that you can hit to pull those data formats down, what approach do you do as you start to construct applications that increasingly go from a single application to a networked application? We're playing with uh, the web services chapter right now and um, if you want to get the materials uh, for this course, you can um, go here and download the uh, sample zip 
sample code.zip. I've got this all sitting already on my computer. I also have the whole thing in GitHub if you want to get it out of GitHub. So the thing we're talking about now is we're talking about the JSON 1.py example from the book. And uh, so JSON is kind of like XML, except a lot simpler. Um, and that's why a lot of people like it. Uh, it's not that JSON is always better, but JSON is, is better in a lot of situations that don't require the complexity of XML. So we, we always we start to import JSON. JSON is built into Python, but we have to ask to import it. Again, we're using a triple-quoted string to put the JSON in there. And JSON looks a lot like Python dictionaries, key-value pairs, key-value pairs. In this case, this is a key, and the value itself is another dictionary, or in uh, uh, JSON terms, an object. But again, key-value pairs within key-value pairs within key-value pairs. And all these little cursor guys have to, uh, all these little curly brace guys have to line up properly. And so, uh, like all the time, this is uh, st a string, which we normally would read and decode from the internet, but for now we're just going to have it in there. Load json.loads says go into the JSON library, pull out load string, and parse this, which turns this set of curly braces, spaces, commas, perhaps syntax errors, into a structured object. And if we'd made a syntax error in here, then this would blow up. But if this doesn't make a syntax error, if this doesn't blow up, then we have a structured representation. Now, the difference between XML and, and Python, uh, JSON, is that this turns into a Python dictionary with key value pairs. Okay, and so once we have this, this is a dictionary. And we can say info subname, and that's the exact syntax that we would use to get the dictionary, and that's going to extract this value out of there. And if we want to go in deeper, we can say info sub email, and that's what info sub email is right there, and then sub hide. So that's like, that's a dictionary within a dictionary. And so if we run this, python3 json1.py, it digs in really fast. And so this is why people tend to like JSON, is because you read the JSON, which is actually a syntax derived from JavaScript, but it looks just like the syntax for a Python. So it's moving an ob that's moving an object, a JSON object that turns in directly into a Python dictionary with nested dictionaries. Now we're going to look at JSON2. And so JSON2, we're going to see a list, or an array in JSON terms, but it turns into a list in Python terms. So this is a list of dictionaries. In JavaScript that would be an array of objects, but in Python it's a list of dictionaries. So we'll just pretend that it's a list of dictionaries. Again, we load the string, parsing, looking for syntax errors. So let's just make a syntax error here and run uh, Python JSON2.py and you'll see where it blows up. It blows up at line 15, which is right here. It's like this load s blows up. Now you could put a try accept around it to save it, but we're not going to do that. And it e even complains, it says, look, we're expecting something here in line 11, and that's line 11 of the JSON, which starts at uh, uh, line 4. Um, and so I'll put my little square brace back in so it's not syntactically broken. So let's run it again and make sure that she runs, and yes she does. So this parses it, and converts from the JSON syntax into a Python, in this case, list, because it's got square braces instead of curly braces. The previous example had square braces. And we can then take a len of it, it's a, and it's an array, or it's a list, and we see that there are two things in there. And then we're going to iterate through, and this item is going to iterate through these dictionaries, that dictionary followed by that dictionary. So the first time, it's item sub name, which is this value right here and then item sub ID, which is this value. So you can dig right into this, but you're using, you're not using get, and you're not using the weird extra find or find all or anything. You just are going at these uh, structures directly. And so you can quickly extract this stuff out, and we read through ID is, uh, name is Chuck. Oops, name is Chuck. The, the no, there are no attributes, by the way. Uh, X is 2, and, and so we had to make X. So if you look at the XML, we had this concept of attributes on the outer tag. There, these things are also not named. We just have to know what we're looking for. So JSON represents simple structures, but it's all it's much simpler uh, to use. So I hope this has been uh, 
useful to you um, uh, and talk to you uh, in a bit about some more JSON. So the service-oriented approach is a way we approach solving a complex application problem where all the data really isn't present in one computer system. It's somehow spread out you know, over the internet, connected via the internet or internal network. And so the, the idea is, is that some applications just can't contain everything. The, the perfect example is a travel website that can book you a flight, book you a car, buy tickets, uh, book you a hotel and do all these things. Well, that travel website is neither a hotel nor a rental car company nor an airline. But what it really does is it talks to all these services somewhere else on the web on your behalf and it makes reservations for you. And so you have this convenient user interface that says, oh, here's your whole vacation. I'm going to figure all this stuff out. Now you say go and it goes book, 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 book and books on all these other other systems. Now it requires a lot of infrastructure, a lot of coordination, and a lot of uh, effort to make sure that your application can talk and these other services that are out there in the internet uh, have good contracts and you know exactly how to send data to them and get data back from them. And so initially when you're building a service oriented architecture often you have one application and it's all internal uh, often it's all one language and then maybe you'll say oh wait a sec we want to take part of what we do and put it in a second system and then sort of come up with a set of rules between the systems and then more and more and more. So now that we're solving our problem using a series of cooperating applications communicating across a network, we're going to talk in a little bit more detail about the notion of what we call web services. And in this, we're going to take a different perspective. Instead of building our application and breaking it into pieces, we're going to have an application that's going to really consume an API from somebody else. So there is some other provider of this API that's not us. And so that if you're going to talk to somebody's data, like Google or Amazon or Twitter, they're going to say, you have to use our API. So what's that? So an API is a contract that says, look, if you do this, and this and this and this, we're going to give you data this way. And they set the rules, they tell you what the URLs are, they'll tell you if it's XML or JSON, and this is called the application program interface. And it's something you read and you understand. And so you go look at the documentation. This is the documentation for the Google Maps API. So it turns out that Google knows a lot about maps. It knows a lot of data, it knows how to search maps, and it actually provides some of those features to you that your application can take advantage of. Um, I took advantage of this at one point by asking all the students in one section of one of my online courses where they were from. And I just let them type in where it was. And then I said, well, I don't know how to code any of that. So I used this API doing what's called geocoding to look all those places up and get precise latitudes and longitudes for the ones Google could figure out. And that saved me a lot of work. Now, these are expensive resources, but I could be patient and make use of these uh, resources, which uh, as long as you use them uh, not too much, they can be free. We'll talk a little bit more about rate limiting and what's free and what's not in a bit. But you start by reading documentation. It says, do this, hit this URL, hit that URL. So if you read that documentation, um, you will find that uh, there is a URL that you can hit. And they tell you where to go. And then you go to this URL, you add a question mark, and then you say address equals, and then Ann Arbor Plus, and there's all these rules. These are called URL encoding rules when you have key values on URLs. The plus means space and percent two C means comma. So these are called URL encoded. But don't worry too much about that because we're gonna have a magic library like we always do in Python that takes care of this. And so if you were to hit this URL, you type it in the exact right way in your browser, you will get back a JSON document. It's an object that has key value pairs. The first value is this status, then it has these results and it's a list and you dive down and eventually you can kind of find the latitude and longitude of the thing that you are looking for. And so the idea is, can we write a program that can read this? And so here's our little program that reads this. And a lot of this is sort of can, uh, comfortable. You've already seen some of this. Um, you import URL lib. We have to parse them JSON. We grab the URL. And then we're going to write a little while loop that's going to ask for a location. And we can type that location in. 
and we've got to concatenate with this URL the location equals and there is a bit of code, a library that called parse URL encode that takes the key and the value so the address equals and then whatever this text is that we read in from the user that goes in here and it does that URL encoding with the pluses and the percent to C and all that stuff is taken care of and that is our URL that we're going to pass to URL open. So we print out that we're going to retrieve it, it prints this out and if you look at this it's too long it has all that fancy stuff on it and then we read it. I mean we open it with URL open and then we read it and decode it. So these two things hit this URL, decode it, and then we retrieved 1669 characters because it's just a, in this case, because we've decoded it, data is a string now. That's read is bytes and data is a string. So we read uh, that many characters, 1669 characters. And then we're going to take this data and we're going to parse it with JSON. And we might get bad data here. It might blow up but it might work. And so in this case it works. Um, we have an error that basically says if we got a bad thing we're going to blow up, but in this case it doesn't blow up. And so now we're going to sort of dig through. And if you go back, let's, let me just go back. So the results sub zero geometry. Let's show you how that works. So results is the first key. So this is a dictionary with a key of results, but then it has a list and the zero item, this list starts here and goes there, and there's, I'm only gonna show part of it, but there's many things here. So the zero item is this, this is the sub zero. And then geometry within that sub zero item. So if we look at that, it is the outer, outer dictionary, the first item in the list, sub geometry. So that grabs one part, that grabs, this part right here. And then we're going to go into location and lat. And those are just keys within keys, a dictionary within a dictionary. And so you see it says sub location, sub lat. And so that is literally going to pull out of that complex structure, that will pull the latitude out and then in the next line, pull the longitude out. So we can pull the latitude and longitude out and then we print it out. And we can go into result sub zero formatted address and that goes into results zero formatted address and that pulls this little bit out. Now it takes a little while to write this stuff and you have to put a lot of debug and you don't necessarily figure out this complex bit here at the end but you know you print it you don't get what you want you say oh wait a sec that was an array so I got to add a little sub zero there to get the first one out of the array but eventually you figure it out and it's not all that difficult it's the first time, first few times you do it, I'm like, what am I doing? But after a while you realize, oh, I'm just sort of tearing this apart and digging deeper and deeper into this data structure, which I just retrieved over the internet from Google, and I learned something good from that. So up next we're going to talk about how sometimes these APIs protect themselves with keys or signatures um, and why that happens and how to solve those problems. We are uh, doing some code samples here. If you want to follow along, you can download the sample code all is the, in a big zip file. Um, I've got it. We are going to be working with the Google Maps API. Uh, in the old days, this Maps API was free and did 2,500 requests per, per day. Um, but now they've made it so that parts of it are uh, behind API keys and you start having to using OAuth and stuff. But not, they haven't put it all behind this one address service that we've been using. That continues to work. And the basic idea of an API is you go read the documentation, you find a URL, and this is going to Google servers, and you pass in the address. And, and we have to pass in the address using what's called URL encoding. So spaces are pluses, uh, that's a comma, and then that's a space. And so we have to pass this in a certain way, but if we do it right, we hit this, we're going to get ourselves some JSON back, and that's really cool. And so deep inside here, we get the real address, you know, a good address. We get a geometry, um, you know, we have the location, we got the latitude and longitude, and we can extract stuff out of here. And so we're talking, and this one here is still rate limited to 2500, but it's one of the few parts of the Google Maps API that is not hidden behind an API key. In a later chapter, we'll show you how to actually talk with the API key 
in the geo data code the geo load uh, shows you how to use an API key if you uh, if you want to jump ahead and take a look at that but for now we're just going to take a look at GeoJSON which is going to retrieve one page and, and tear it apart so let's take a look so we're going to grab the URL web stuff and import JSON so now we're going to use JSON but we're going to actually pull the data out of uh, the, out of the internet and so I just take that service URL for Google Maps API I found that somewhere in the documentation and then I'm gonna have a loop that's gonna run forever I'm gonna add for the at the location and then if I hit enter that's what this is saying get out of the loop and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna concatenate the the service URL which is this and this URL per parse uh, URL and code gives a dictionary of address equals and this this bit right here um, gives me the string that leads to putting this address equals but then coding these spaces the right way so if you type a space that bit of code turns it into the plus so that's important and I've got the question mark sitting here at the end of that then what we're going to do is we're just going to do a URL open to get a handle we're going to read the whole document and because it's UTF-8 coming from the outside world and we want it turned into Unicode inside our application we say dot decode we can ask how many characters we got and we put our JSON load s now up till now we've been just doing load s's from internal strings but this is now a string that came from the outside world and um, we'll put a try accept in and we'll set js to be none and that'll be our little trigger now we can look for they, they give us if we take a look at the output we, they give us this okay and that status can be a problem and it can complain about things so we have to check to see if we got a good status so at this point if you look at the outer bit of this the outer bit that we get is a curly brace so it's an, a dictionary then there is within that dictionary a key results which is a list but then the second thing in the outer dictionary is status and so we can ask if the the word the the um, <clears throat> if we got a false if we got nothing that will quit if uh, we don't have a status key in that job in that uh, J, the object or that dictionary or it's not equal to OK any number of those things if this or this or this are all either of those are true we're going to quit print failure to retrieve and print the data out and when you're starting to read stuff off the net you often have to put debugging in here like this to like oh something quit I got to figure out so, and so debugging it next thing we're going to do is call json dump s which is the opposite of load s which takes this array that include a uh, uh, dictionary that includes arrays and we're going to pretty print it with an indent of four and then we're going to print that out and so if, if you look at my code we'll see that the first thing we do once we parsed it is we print it back out so we can see it and then we're going to dig into it so let's go ahead and run this code python geo json dot pi R. One of these days, I will always type Python 3, Ann Arbor, comma, Michigan. Okay, so it ran, and so you see that it retrieved this URL. This URL was constructed and retrieved 1736 characters, and it's JSON pretty printed with an indent of 4, and this is that, this is that JSON dump s all the way down to here. So that's just JSON dump s, and then it starts extracting. So it's going to pull things out. Now, when, I, when you write this code, it's really easy to look at this and say, oh, great, it's easy. I tend to have to print this stuff out over and over and over as I kind of construct this expression. But if we look at it, the, the outer dictionary, the outer dictionary sub results leads to this array. And if you go look at this array carefully, you find there is only one thing in it. And so that the results is an array. Sub zero gets us this uh, this dictionary I keep wanting to say object because that's what it's called and that goes all the way down to here so that's what we get there and then within that we now have an object and we look for geometry within that object where is geometry right there geometry geometry goes from there to there there's geometry in there you gotta get used to it that's why it's nice to have this stuff indented geometry sub low oops come back come back 
and then we go to location within that, so geom location within geometry, and then within lo ge location we have lat and long, and so this is pulling out this 42 and 83. And then, so we print that out, take a look, and that prints that out, pulls that right out of the JSON. These are tricky to write, but after a while you win and you get it right and it's just fine. Okay, um, and so we do the same thing, result sub zero, formatted address gets us this. And so that's how we print the location out. And so that's a real quick look at how we would do that with uh, the JSON talking to the, the Google Maps API. Okay, hope this helps. Now we're going to talk about API rate limiting and security. The, the key thing is, is that the Google API and the Google data is super valuable. And you could build a website that did nothing but sort of like ask the person for something and then showed them that place and make it be a map searcher. And you added so little value and Google did all the hard work. And so they protect these somewhat. Sometimes they'll say you can only do 50 of these a day or 500 a day or whatever. That's called rate limiting. Uh, and sometimes they say you've got to log in. You've got to create an account and get a key with us and then present your key. So that means that your account only gets so many. And they keep track of who's using their service and how much they're using it. Um, Google gives you even sort of a dashboard that tells you some of this stuff. It's kind of nice. Um, and so you and and the other thing is that sometimes an API is free and then it becomes popular and they decide they're going to put a key on it or a rate limit on it. So you got to kind of play this game with them and the rules kind of change as things progress. So that geocoding API that we we're talking about has, uh, has at one point in time 2,500 requests a day. Uh, you can get more requests if you get a key. Now, Another API that we can talk about is the Twitter API. Now, Twitter API started out as a free public API, but then Twitter realized that people were making more money off of Twitter's data than Twitter was making off of Twitter's data. And so Twitter makes it so that you have to have an account. You can only, you can only request data from their API is if you use your account key to sign that. And so there's a whole series of getting and issuing keys and then using those keys. And I'll just give you a short summary of the kind of code that it takes to build those, key, build those uh, requests up that have to be signed. So you'll look through the, the Twitter documentation and it'll say, oh, this URL to get the tweets, et cetera, et cetera. And you're, it says do a get request to this URL and that URL and maybe substitute a little bit of things here for the screen name you're looking for or how many tweets you want. And they tell you how to carefully construct these URLs um, and so here's an example bit of code that talks to the Twitter. Um, now, for, for now, I'll ignore the security bit. Um, that's all hidden in this TW URL. So it looks a lot like the last one. We're going to use JSON and URL lib. And we have found that this is the API name, uh, blah, 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 list.json, getting a friend list for a particular person. And so that is the base URL that we're going to do. Um, and uh, we're going to ask a person for a Twitter account. If we hit enter, we're going to break out. And TWURL augment, we're going to say, give me the first five friends of this particular screen name, the one we just read in from input. Um, and this TWURL, you'll see in a second, it adds a bunch of stuff to prove that you are who you are. Um, it's signing that URL. So you're sending a signed URL, which is nothing more than a whole bunch of crazy characters. We'll see that in a second. We retrieve it, and this is pretty straightforward. We can just you know, open the URL, uh, read it, and decode it. Decode solves the UTF-8 thing, uh, makes it all so that data is a real string and it's in Unicode internally. Now we can actually get the headers. Remember I told you earlier that URL open um, bypasses the headers, but it's stored them for later. And we can say, hey, give me back those headers. And that gives us back a dictionary of headers. And the headers, if you go all the way back, are a bunch of key value pairs, key colon value in the headers. And in Twitter, if you read the documentation, there's this x dash rate limit remaining that tells you each time it returns to the API, uh, response to the API call that you made, it says, look, you've got 12 left. You've got 11 left. You've got 10. So you can print that out. So this prints out how many you've got left. Then we parse the JSON data. We're going to print it so we can debug it. This dump s, dump 
uh, dump to string and then printed. Indent equals four. This is called pretty printing, and it's indenting things really nicely so that you can make more sense of it. Whereas uh, when these things are talking, when programs are talking to each other, they don't really make the output look particularly pretty. Pretty. Um, and then if you uh, you're, we're going to go through, we have uh, the outer thing of users, and we're going to print out the screen name and go grab the, uh, for each user and users, we're going to print their screen name, we're going to grab their status text and print that out. And so this is what that data looks like, kind of chopped a bit. So the thing we get is an outer layer, we get users, and then we get a list, and here's the first user. Now if you look at the actual data, it's much larger than this. Here's a second user. And then we have status text, status text, and the screen name, right? And so those are the bits that we're extracting from that. If you look, we are going to grab the screen name, we're going to grab the status text, and away you go. So the, it, 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 you can start with this, but you realize that once you're looking at this and you're printing this out with pretty printing, you can sort of work your way in, knowing that it's an, either a dictionary or a list, if it's a dictionary, you look up the key. If it's a list, you say which position it is, and then you get more dictionaries within dictionaries within dictionaries, and away you go. And so this code um, actually, you know, when it runs, it prints out the screen name and then that status and the next person. So it's my first five, in that case, my first five friends and their most recent status, the first five people. Now, let's talk a little bit about how this security works. And so you have to go to the the website, you have to have a Twitter account. You can't talk to Twitter API without a Twitter account. And then you go to this website and then you set up a key. You say, I'm going to have build an application that is going to consume the Twitter API. And then you go in, you have to work through, there's documentation on how, the, how all this stuff works. You set up an API key, you set the application. So I made a key called Python on my laptop. And it gives us some values. It gives us a consumer key, a consumer secret, a token key, and a token secret. And you get to regenerate these. And there's this file called hidden.py, and you edit them and copy and paste all the stuff from those pages, those four values, into these strings. Now, if you download my code, I don't have my keys in there. I got some placeholders for this stuff. So you got to get to this web page that's on Twitter, copy these things in, and then the TWRL code will start to work. It uses a technology called OAuth, which is a way to sign a URL in a way that proves that you have the key and the secret and the tokens, and the tokens but uh, and it can't be modified in the middle. So once you send this URL, they can check the key and the secret to make sure that you truly signed it without actually sending the key and the secret. It's actually kind of cool and fascinating, but we won't go into it in great detail here. And so if you look at the code in twurl.py, this is the code that does it. It actually pulls in an OAuth library, that hidden.py, um, that is that code that you've got. Um, and it's got the consumer key, the consumer secret, secrets, you know, that this is pulling that from hidden.py. Uh, this is a lot of stuff that's using this OAuth library. Don't worry too much about that. Eventually, it produces a URL that looks like this. And the way what happens is this was the base URL you were told to use. Then you have count equals two and screen name equals Dr. Chuck. Those parts are your parameters to that web service call. And then all this OAuth stuff is produced by this OAuth code and the consumer key and the secret. What happens is the key gets sent, the key gets sent, the and the uh, secret does not get sent, but they send this signature, which is based on the secret. And then what it does is it rechecks the, the signature on the far end. Signature is a long string by regenerating the signature because the, the secret's on available to both you to generate the signature and to them to check the signature. So it's kind of like a hash, et cetera, et cetera. You don't have to worry about all this. These URLs get really long and your values that you need are in, the name of the URL is in, and you call this routine. That's called augment. It takes a URL and then parameters and then augments it by adding all this OAuth stuff. And so that's why it's called augment to augment the URL. And once you got this set up and hidden working, then you sort of just augment the URL and then hit it. Now, 
you know, if you don't have the right keys or secrets or you don't have an account on Twitter, then it's going to blow up. But if you get it set up, you will be able to talk to the Twitter API with this. So this whole web services section, we've done quite a bit of stuff, right? We have looked at how instead of reading HTML or flat text, um, we are creating structured data according to contracts, whether it be XML or JSON. We can retrieve and parse that information in a deterministic way. We talked about schemas that define the contracts so that you know if the data you're getting is wrong, you can know who to blame because the schema gets violated. And um, we've played with uh, APIs where you're talking to someone else who's defining what the rules are and how to read their documentation. And even if they have an API key or a need to sign URLs, showed a little bit about how to do that. We're doing some code, uh, sample code, playing through with uh, some sample code samples. And uh, you can get this by downloading it. I've got this whole thing downloaded and um, I've got all, all the files here. And these are the files we're going to play with today. Um, today what we're going to do is talk to the, about the Twitter API. And the, and the one thing we've got to learn about the Twitter API is we have to authorize ourselves. And so we have to you know, make sure that uh, we have a Twitter account and then we get some keys. And so for in this particular application, if you want to duplicate what I'm doing, you have to go to apps.twitter.com, click this Create New Application button, and then get some codes. Okay, And the codes show up as soon as you hit this button and then one more button, which I'm not going to do on screen. Um, and so what happens is there are four codes that you've got to put in this file, hidden.py. The consumer key, the consumer secret, the token key, and token secret. These are just messed up. so. I'll show you how this works and blows up if first, and then I'll, I'll put my keys in here without showing you. Uh, but basically, this is a little file you got to edit, or these Twitter ones stop, don't work. You'll see what happens. So the first one I'm going to do is, is do the simplest one of all, and that is I call, call this thing Twitter test, and it just is going to go ask for the user timeline, and we can take a look at this, and we're going to uh, take the URL and we're going to augment the URL. This is the base. We found this looking at the Twitter API documentation. We're going to pass a parameter of screen name Dr. Chuck and a count of two. So this is just a Python dictionary. And augment comes from this little bit of called code called TWURL. And this uses a bit of code called OAuth, which is built into uh, Python as well. Right? Yeah, that's built into Python as well. And it augments the URL and it takes the, the key, the secret, the token key, and does a thing and signs it, and then makes this big, long, ugly URL, which you will soon see, and does this, it's a signature of the URL. So we, we pass this data back and forth to Twitter uh, with a signature, and then they recheck the signature, and it's a digital signature that knows that this URL came from a program that knows the key, secret, and token, and token secret. And so this augment basically is something that I wrote, TWRL augment is something I wrote to make it easier to add all these OAuth parameters. And you feed this code by putting your data into hidden.py. Lots of people get this to work, so don't worry. It's kind of cool when you finally get it to work. So let's take a look at what it does. Just, to, just know that this makes an awesome URL that does all the security. And we'll see one of those URLs. Um, so in, ignore the certificate errors. This has to do with the fact that uh, HT, we're using HTTPS and Python doesn't have enough certificates put into it by default for a lot of reasons, but our quick and dirty way is to turn them off. Uh, thank you, Python, for reducing security by teaching us so that this is the best way to do it. That's a grumpy moment from on my part. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a URL open. This bit here is to shut off the security checking for the SSL certificate. Um, and then we're going to read all the data, and then we're going to just want to print it out. And we're also going to um, ask the connection, this URL. Remember I told you a long time ago that URL lib eats the headers, but you can get them back. And now we're going to ask to get a dictionary of the headers back. And so we'll print those out. Okay. So this is really kind of just testing the, the body and the headers and printing them out sort of in as raw a way we can do. So let's go run this. Now this is going to fail the first time we do it because we haven't put the 
hidden variables in there. So if I say python 3 twtest.p.py, it's going to run and blow up, and it's going to give you this 401 authorization required. That's a good sign, because that means that you haven't yet updated your values in hidden.py. And so the, this, this, is the UR, this is that augmented URL, and you can see the consumer key and the consumer secret and the OAuth token and whatever. Okay, so these tokens are like wrong. These are the these aren't. Oops, Control C. Uh, they aren't real. And then, the, and, but you'll notice it doesn't have the key and the secret and the token key, uh, the token secret and the secret. Um, and that's all actually encoded in this signature. It turns out that you you need to have the key and the token. I mean, the secret and the token secret to generate the the uh, signature. And um, where is the signature? Oh, there's the signature. Right there's the signature. And so. This signature combined with the nonce, that you can only do this signature has a time and includes all kinds of things. So even if you type this in, well, you'll see these go by and it's not really breaking my security too much when you see these afterwards. So don't get all excited when you say, oh, I, you revealed your token and your, your key. Well, I can reveal my token and key, but I can't, I'm not gonna reveal the secret. Okay, so this adds all this OAuth stuff, OAuth nonce, OAuth timestamp, and these timestamps and nonces are made it so that you can't replay my URL even if you see the exact URL. Uh, once I hit it, then you can't hit it again. And so that's what the nonce does. So I'm going to close hidden.py here. And I'm going to update hidden.py in another window. Okay, so so I just, in another window, I updated hidden.py. I'm not going to show you that. But now I'm going to run python twtest.py. So twurl is going to read hidden, and now these keys and secrets are my real ones that I haven't shown you. So this should work. Fingers crossed. Yay, it worked. Okay, so it worked. So I'm calling Twitter. Here's the URL. Now, don't worry. The token and the consumer key are not enough to break into my account, and neither is the signature because you can't replay this. In about five minutes, you can't replay this anymore, okay? So you can't generate the signature. I've done one, this, the signature, the signature includes the time and date, so you can't, trust me, go read up on OAuth, don't worry. I haven't really revealed anything. But, so the first thing we see is this. So we see, and we should put like the line of dashes here, this is the JSON. It ain't very pretty. It's not very pretty. Okay, and so that's the JSON from there to there. It's just what most APIs give us back. It's really dense JSON, right? And so this is a byte array. Remember how you have to do a dot decode? I didn't do a dot decode here. And so this is telling, and Python is telling us this is a byte array, which it's a raw set of bytes that came from the internet, which probably are UTF-8, and if I put a decode here, then it would decode. If I, I say dot data dot decode there, then it would be fine. But it, we don't care. This was just a dump. Do we get anything? And so then, here, let's do this. Print. I'll just make this code different. Ooh, put some equal signs here, a lot of equal signs. So we can show, easily see the, where, the, um, where the thing starts and stops. So we'll run that again if you look at those URLs. So that was all of that stuff. And then this is the headers. And so the headers, again, are not pretty. You get the headers, it's a dictionary. You got cache control, no cache, comma. This, this is the string, key value. You got to find your commas, key value. But the one that's really interesting here is, uh, which one is it? X rate limit remaining, right there. X rate limit re remaining. So that means that for this particular API, and this header tells me that I've got 898 calls left. And this is when I will get more calls. And uh, yeah, so so let's see. Yeah, so, so watch. I'm going to do this again, and you will see that I can only do this 897 more times now. Do do do. Run it. I can only do this 897. So I am being tracked at this point. I am being tracked by Twitter 
he know Twitter knows that it's Dr. Chuck that's doing this, and Dr. Chuck has done 900, he's done 899, 897, and if I keep running this, eventually Twitter will tell me, you got to wait for a while. And that's because Twitter doesn't want me, under my Dr. Chuck account, pulling out like lots and lots of stuff out of Twitter and making my own website. Now, I do actually have my own Twitter website using some cool software, www.drchuck.com slash Twitter. And this I have to run and it, and it rate limits and causes all kinds of, you know, whatever. So, um, okay, so Twitter, rate limit. Um, so, I'll save that. So that's tweet, this is just to test it, okay? Because we're doing, I want to do something interesting. So we're not parsing the JSON that comes back. We're not doing anything tricky with this. And away we go. So, let's take a look at some more code. I think I don't need this anymore. So now I am going to uh, parse this. So most of this looks the same. I've got that same user timeline JSON. I'm going to ignore the SSL certificates. I'm going to write a loop. So I'm going to ask the Twitter, I'm going to print, um, I'm going to get a Twitter account and quit if it's a blank line or if I had to enter. I'm going to use the Twitter URL augment the same way. That's going to do all the signing using from hidden.py. I retrieve it, and I'm going to retrieve it, ignoring the, the SSL errors. And then I'm going to decode it. This time I'm going to decode it so that I get a real Unicode string. And I'm going to print the first 250 characters of it. I'm going to grab the headers, and I'm going to print the, uh, the remaining uh, the rate limit. So this is sort of a very uh, simple version of this uh, same thing. It really is decoding the data and only printing the first 250 characters. So let's run that. Dr. Chuck. Boom. And it's got 896. So that's just a little simpler version of that with a little less uh, brutal debugging. Okay, so now let's do something even more fun. Let's go to twitter2.py and tear it apart. And so, um, so again, we're going to look at my friends list um, or someone else, anybody's friends list. We're going to ask for the friends and ask for the screen name, ask for the first five friends, and then look at their statuses, uh, open it, decode it, get the headers, print the rate limit remaining. All this stuff is the same as in Twitter 1. And But now we're going to parse the JavaScript. I'm not even putting this in a try and accept because, hey, I'm talking to Twitter. I'm going to guess that Twitter is going to give me the right stuff. You probably want to put a try and accept here. Then I'm going to do a debug print. I'm going to do a JSON uh, pretty print. Let's make that be two so it looks a little better. Um, and then, well, I'm going to run it, and then you're going to see how we have to parse this. And we're going to see that it, it's a list. Um, so we're done with that. And now we're running twitter2.py. So I'm going to go to Dr. Chuck. And this is going to ask the question who Dr. Chuck's friends are. Okay, let's go to the top. So it hit this API, and it has the uh, screen name Dr. Chuck count equals five and all this OAuth stuff. Again, this is not a security breach by showing you all of this because the signature, the secrets aren't there. Okay, so if we look at it, it it's an outer, it's an it's an outer object or dictionary. And then the outer has a users, which is a list. And then each user has some stuff in it. So this one's Stephanie Teasley. It's got her screen name. It's got some descriptions. Keep on going. It's got her status, her latest status for my friend, her status, her source, where she's at. I don't know, man, she's got a lot of stuff here. Okay, there we go. That was the first one. Okay, and then the next one that I'm following is live edu, etc. And so you'll see that this is an array. So that outer thing is an array of users. Now, JS here is a dictionary. So I can say for you in JS subusers. Well, JS subusers is a list. So the first U is going to be this Stephanie Teasley U, and the second U is going to be live edu. So that's all it took to get through all that stuff and figure that out. And then I'm going to say, 
uh, get me the screen name of my person. So let's go in here. So that's going to pull Stephanie Teasley as Steph Teasley out. Then, then I'm going to go find her status. Let's find her somewhere in here. Use of the use of status subtext. Come on. Okay, there's sub status. Sub status is all this stuff. More, 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 more. Right there. That's status. That's use sub status is that. And then use sub status subtext is this stuff. So it's going to extract this bit right here. Okay. And so use status text. And I print out the first 50 characters of the screen name status. And I do that for the first five because I told um, I told it I only wanted five. And then, of course, I get to see the, the rate limit. So let's go down to the bottom. So all of this is the debug print of the JSON I got back. Here is the program starting to print. Here is the screen name of my first friend. And here's the first 50 characters of her most recent status. Here is the screen, screen name of my, and these are in uh, reverse order who I've been uh, following. So I've been playing with this live coding stuff. So I'm following them. Um, what? Key error status. That didn't work. Why not? Oh, that's because Live Coding TV somehow doesn't have a status. So most of these work. So now you'll get to see me fix something. And when you download it, it'll be fixed. And so it says key error status. So that means that I've got to do a thing that says if status not in you print no status found continue <laughs> since sometimes there's no statuses who would have thought I did not know that yeah so you Okay, so let's run this again. Um, oh, I didn't even, did I get to see my remaining? Oh, actually, let me change the order of this. Let me put this down here. Uh, it'll be wrong from the slides, but it'll be prettier now. Let's put the headers after the dump of the data. Okay, so let's run it again. Did I save it? Yeah, Dr. Chuck, blah, whole bunch of stuff. So I got 13 remaining calls on this one. So it's not the same as the other one. I, you know, I don't get to call this too many more times, so hopefully I'll get the debugging to work. <laughs> sort of. I got a bad space here. I got no, not status found, no status found. And I'm putting, I need to put three spaces there. No status found. I'll make an asterisk. So let's run it again. And see, I got 13 remaining. So it's important you write code that's aware of your remaining. That's why I made so so obvious about that. Go retrieve all that. I got 12 remaining, but my code starts to look. Oh, dang it! I have another space here. Hang on, got to fix that. I need yet another space. Hopefully, I can make this as pretty as I want it to work. Oh, wait a sec. <laughs> I didn't even do Dr. Chuck. I did that wrong. I typed my name wrong. Okay, so now it works. <laughs> oh, well. So so now I have my first, f most five recent friends are this Steph Teasley, Live Edu Official, Life Coding TV, Nancy Gilby, um, and Greg E. Kruger. And so there are their statuses, and I tore all this JSON apart using uh, twitter2.py. Of course, after fixing hidden.py, which I'm not going to show you because it actually contains my real consumer key and consumer secret. You're seeing the consumer key and the token key go by on each of these URLs, but what you're not seeing is these two things, which are the thing I'm protecting, so that it's not a problem. 
Okay, so I will send that up. But uh, there you go. Welcome. Uh, thank. I hope this. I hope you found this useful. Uh, the code will be fixed when you take a look at it uh, and download it here from uh, samplecode.zip. Hello and welcome to Python Objects. I'm Charles Severance, and uh, we're well on our way to uh, to getting through all this material in the Python. So this lecture is in a weird place. I even debated where to put it in the book. Um, I don't really want to teach you how to write a lot of object-oriented programming, but we're going to start using objects, and I want to be able to use the terminology. And so as much as anything, this lecture is about terminology and understanding the words, things like methods and method signatures and variables and inheritance. And so think of this as a terminology lecture rather than a learn how to program or learn how to use this. It's not something you're going to figure out right away. And th there'll come a time when you as a programmer really want to start using object-oriented programming. It's really a powerful and wonderful uh, technique. But uh, I think it's uh, too early as a beginning programmer to really say, oh, let's write a bunch of objects. So just relax and enjoy and learn this material and think of it as sort of a, a theoretical thing rather than, you know, a how to program thing. And so part of this is we're going to start reading data structures and I mean uh, data uh, on how to use all these uh, libraries, etc. And we're going to see the word objects, right? And then we're going to start hearing them. And I want you to be able to read the Python documentation so that you understand what's going on. And so, you know, the word object should make sense to you, even though you're not going to write a lot of object-oriented programming. And so page upon page upon page, uh, database stuff, which we're going to talk about soon, is uh, uses objects all over the place. And the beautiful soup talks about uses objects. Uh, we've kind of been using them, and I've been waving my hands, and I use the word method without defining it. But now it's really time to define it and go, go to it. So um, I want to review uh, from the very beginning what we think of as a program. So the classic program, my favorite little minimum program, is our little uh, elevator floor con converter, which, uh, which converts from European elevator floors to United States elevator floors. And the key to this is that it's input processing and output. And this is a good way to model any program. Um, and in that process, we've got variables, and we've got uh, logic, we've got algorithms, we've got loops that we write, we've got all kinds of things. And we construct a series of steps to achieve uh, some goal. Um, in object-oriented, and, and frankly, you've been using object-oriented all along, the program has lots of objects, and we're sort of putting stuff into these objects, taking stuff out of one object and putting it into another object. And you, you've actually been doing this all along. As soon as you're looking at dictionaries and lists, you're doing objects. And so it's, it, it, an object is, is quite a little thing. It's sort of its own little space inside of a program that contains uh, code and data. Um, and so we're working together. All these objects are now working together. It's a bit of self-contained code and data. And it is one way to take a very complex problem and make it easier by breaking it into separate things that can be engineered and, and developed separately. So you've been using string objects, or maybe you'd use beautiful soup or something. These are powerful capabilities. And if you had to look at all of them, um, it's just, hey, here's a thing. Use this object. It'll do these things for you. And there's lots of details inside of it. Just don't look at it. Don't worry about it. And so there's boundaries, the things that you can use, things that you can look at, and things that really you don't bother looking at. You go read the documentation and use it, and away it goes. But then someone had to write that, and so they built an object. So what we're going to do is look a little bit under the covers of what it takes to build some of these objects. Um, <clears throat> and so if we think of this program that originally just sort of did processing, we can think of it as having some kind of an input, right, coming into our program. And we have a string object, a dictionary object, maybe eventually some objects like a database object or an object that we eventually define. And you can think of us, we're receiving data, it comes in an object, which is a string object, or we start putting the str strings in dictionaries and do whatever, we pull out a list of them. And, and so you can think of data as moving between these objects. And like I say, even strings in the first week First lecture, first week, first everything. We, um, we were using objects, and we've been using them all along. 
And so you can think of every string and every dictionary as a little program all by itself that has a bit of code and a bit of data. Um, and so a string has the data which includes all the characters that make up the string, but then there is a method called uh, upper that does uppercase, or rstrip that strips off the right, a white space from the right. And so it's, it's like they're almost little programs that have inputs and outputs themselves, and we can make lots of them. And there's lots of cooperating objects that make up an application. Um, and one of the nice things about the object-oriented pattern is that they form boundaries. And within the boundary, if you're inside the object, you can say, look, I'm going to build you a string object or a database object or a beautiful soup object, and I'm going to build this capability, and I'm going to give it to you in the form of an interface, and I'm not really going to care how you use it. And so we have this sort of visibility wall where I'm going to make an object and I'm going to let you use it, and the maker of the object doesn't necessarily have to know every single thing about the use of that object. But so just like inside the object, they don't have to worry about what you're doing with the object outside of it, when you're outside the object, you don't have to worry about what's going on inside of it. We, as the user of the object, we talk to its interface and we get things from it and give things to it and use functionality within that object, but we don't have to look inside of this. We can just say, oh, it's a nice little magical thing. We read the documentation, we read a web page, and it told us to do this, this, and this, and away you go. And so it is, a, it is sort of this isolation boundary that works both for the programmer who's writing the object and the programmer who's using the object. And so it's a, it's a very nice pattern. Um, and so you'll see how we're going to build code and we're going to group it together and then we're going to be using it sort of as a, a big uh, a blob of stuff. So some definitions in this space, words that I want you to understand. Um, when we're going to create one of these things, one of these objects, instances, that has some data in it and some code in it, we have to be able to define the shape of this object. What code will each object have in it and what data will each object have uh, in it? And that's called a class. The key to a class, and this little picture that I've got up here in all these slides, is a key. The class is a template. It's not the thing itself. So it's a cookie cutter. It knows a lot about how cookies are made. And if you have cookie dough and you hit the thing, then you make as many cookies as you want. And so this nice little cookie picture is a great you know, mental model of how it works. The class, the class, oops, the class is the template, and then the object are all of the cookies that are made from that template. But the template defines the shape and the nature of the class. So the code that we write is, uh, is going, uh, of each of the objects, the code we write is the class code and then later we say, oh, let's take that template and make ourselves an object or an instance. Now, as we're defining a class, we have two basic things that we put in the class. And there's a couple of different terminologies for this. One is method, which is code. It's like a function that lives inside of a class. Not a function that lives inside your program, but one that lives inside of a class. And so this is a scoping thing. A method is really just a function but it's lived, it lives inside the class. And then fields or attributes are data items that are in the class. And so they're variables that are defined in the class. You can define variables outside the class that you use in your program, and you've been doing that all along. But if you're saying, I'm going to build this capability, and it's going to have data inside of it and code inside of it, the code is the method or message and field or attribute. And they're just, there are just two, um, two different sets of terminology Method is what I'll probably use. If you look in some object-oriented patterns like Smalltalk or Apple, they often will call these messages. So you can either like access a method inside of a class or an object, or you can send a message to the object. Um, the same is true for field and attribute. It's just a chunk of data that's in the object that may, you may or may not have uh, the right to access. So, like I said, a class is a template. It defines the characteristics of the objects that we're going to use to make it. It is the cookie cutter. So, dog is sort of the exemplar. Uh, Lassie is a particular dog. And so, dog has fur, and dog barks, and do dogs do all these things. And so, we know something about dogs, but it doesn't mean we have a dog, right? We, and the, and the, the class is a more abstract concept that, that when it's time to get a dog, we know certain things about dogs. Instances, or objects, are 
once we say, oh, time to make a cookie from the template, time to get a dog, we know something about dogs, that's the creation of an object, and that we call them instances, uh, instance of a class. So the class is a, 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 it doesn't exist, but we say, make me a new uh, object using this class as its template. Oh, and now make me another one. And so we can have many, many objects from one class. So just like many cookies from one cookie cutter. Method is a bit of code that lives inside of an object. Uh, it's like a function, but it's scoped to within the object or within the class. Okay, so that kind of gets us started on uh, some of the terminology, and we'll come back and we'll take a look at how we write code uh, that's object-oriented. Okay, so now that we've gotten through the definitions, let's work into some sample code. But hey, look at this. We've got ourselves a cookie cutter and some cookies. So remember that a class is a template. It's not the actual thing. An object is an instance of a class. So you have to take the class and do something to make the object. And actually, you can see here's some other classes. There's clearly a sort of a snowflake class and a gingerbread man class. That's an object, object, object. Somewhere out here, there is a snowflake class and a gingerbread class. But we got a, a snowman object and a snowman object and a snowman class. So class is the template object is the instance. So here's a bit of Python code. So let's take a look at what we got here. Class is a new reserved word, kind of like def. We have the name of the class. That is a name that we choose. We're going to, that's the name by which we'll refer to this class for the rest of this program. Um, and it has a colon at the end of it, and which means it starts an indented block, which ends when we de-indent. Inside the class, there are generally two things. There is some data, and this just looks like an assignment statement in the class, x equals zero. And then there is a def. Def look, this looks just like a function, and then it starts with a def, has a colon, indents, so that function finishes right there. The difference is, is this is a method because it lives inside of a class. And so there is no function called party. There's a function called party within party animal class. And we'll talk in a second about this self thing. It is the way that inside this code refer, we refer back to that variable. So this is not actually executing any code. It's sort of remembering the template, defining the class party animal. This is what we call constructing. We're constructing a, using the party animal template or class. We are making a party animal. And then once we make that, we stick it in the variable uh, a n, and then we're going to call this party animal, uh, this party method, three times one, two, three. Now this self thing, and we'll take a look at the self. The self ends up being an alias of a n, and so you can look at this syntax. It's just kind of an equivalent of this syntax. It's calling the party method within the party animal class and passing the instance in as the first parameter. And so self ends up being an alias of a n each time these are called. Now if we make a different variable and a second object, which we will eventually, you will see that, that that works a little bit differently. And so this syntax is a short version of that syntax. So if we watch how this executes, it's, oops, it starts up here, it just defines it, and then we construct it. And that's what basically constructing it we know how to construct it because we look at the class and we make a variable x, we make some code party, and then we construct that, that's what the party animal does, and then we assign that into a n. And so a n is now pointing at that. Then when we call the party method, that basically takes this a n and pass it in, in, passes it in as the first parameter, which is used as self, and so self.x, which is what we're doing in this line right here, self.x is a variable. x starts out as 0. x starts out as 0 because when it was constructed, it was set to 0. So we're in here. a n is an alias of self. And now it looks up self.x, which is 0, adds 1 to it. And so this becomes 1. And then we print so far, so far 1. And then the code returns, and it goes down and does it again. And x becomes 2 prints out so far 2, comes back down, and does the last time, calls it again, self.x is 2, add 1 to it and stick it back in, so this becomes 3, and we print out 3, and then the program finishes. And so you can think of this as 
constructing the object and then associating it with this AN variable. Now that we've created this object, we can play around with things we've played around before with dir and type. We use dir and type to kind of inspect variables and types and objects. So we've been using objects all along. We This code here says, hey, make me an empty list. Well, it turns out that what we're saying is there is already a list class inside of Python and we're constructing an empty list. And when we get back this empty list, we're assigning that into X. So X, in a sense, contains or points to an empty list. So then we say, hey, what is in X? What kind of thing is X? Well, it's a list. This is a thing, it's a list type. It lists have list of things in them. And, you know, use append and all the things we've been doing before, they're just objects. And then the dir, if you remember the dir, the dir is the capabilities. And there's all these internal capabilities that do things like implement the bracket operator, etc. Those double underscore ones, we can ignore them, although you can even look them up and figure out what they mean if you feel like it. But the methods that we tend to call are in this class. And so things like x.sort, I've always told you that is the sort method within the x thing. And the dot operator is the operator that we use to look something up within an object. And so you've been using the syntax all along. x.sort, dictionary.items, all of those are methods within the corresponding class. If we take a look at this line of code that we've been doing for a very long time, which says, oh, stick hello there into y. It's, if I reword that as more OO or object oriented, what this single quote does says, make me a string object and put some text in it. And then when that is done being constructed, stick that into y, right? And so y now, points to a string object that's been pre-initialized to the string hello there. Now that's a long way of saying hello there ends up in y, but in OO terms we can talk about that. If we do a dir of that, we see a whole bunch of internal uh, methods which have double underscores, and then we see all kinds of methods that we've been using. We've been using methods like uh, upper, we've been using methods like find, we've been using methods like um, uh, rstrip. Right? We've been using these methods. So we go to like um, y.rstrip, parenthesis. Again, that's a method, that's an object, not a class, it's an object, and that is the object lookup operator. Now if we do the same thing to code that we've built, or a class that we've built, so now we have a party animal class. Remember this up to here is just definition. Now we construct it and we store it in an. So an is a variable that contains an object of type party animal. We ask it what type it is, and it prints out here. It says, this is a class, and it's main underscore party animal. And this whole thing here is the is underscore main. It's scoped underscore main. But you can see that you have made a new type. You built a type by using this class keyword. And then we use the dir. Remember, dir looks for capabilities. And again, you will see, um, You'll see a whole bunch of underscore things. They have meaning, you can look them up, but eventually you'll see the two things that you've put in it. One is the method party, and the other is the attribute or field x. And again, these are the things that you can say an.x or an.party, because this dot is the object operator, the object lookup operator that says, look up in the object an the thing x, or look up in the object an the thing party. Okay, so up next we'll talk a little bit about how objects are created and destroyed. We also call that object life cycle. Now we're going to talk a little bit about object life cycle. And what we mean by object life cycle is the act of creating and destroying these objects. And I've been using this term constructor already. And so uh, when we declare a variable, whether it's a string or a dictionary or a party animal, there we create them and then they're discarded and there's all this dynamic memory that comes and goes. And we as the writers of objects have the ability to insert ourselves at the moment of object creation and at the moment of object destruction. And we make um, special functions that we call the constructor, the object constructor or the class constructor and the destructor and we don't actually explicitly call them, they're called automatically by, the, uh, by Python on our behalf. 
And so the constructor is uh, what's more commonly used. It's used to set up any initial values of variables if necessary, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Destructors are, we'll, we'll cover them, but they're, uh, they're used very rarely. So here's a bit of code that we've got. Um, it's our party animal, and a lot of it is the same as what we've been doing so far. Um, so we have this variable x, and the constructor has a special name, underscore, underscore, init, underscore. Again, we pass in the instance of the object, self. And in this one, all we're going to do is print out that you're constructed. And here's this code that we've had before. And now we have underscore, underscore, del, and then we pass in self. And we'll just print out uh, that we're being destructed and what the current value of x is for that particular instance. So let's go ahead and run this. Um, and so again, this doesn't really do any code up to here. That just defines party animal, but this is the constructing of it. And basically that says, oh, and it really kind of creates these variables and then it also runs the constructor. And so in this case, this line right here is causing the I am constructed message to come out. Then we do and party, a and party, and that says, you know, one and two. And here's an interesting thing. We're actually going to destroy this variable by throwing away an no longer points at that object. An is going to point to 42. So we're going to sort of overwrite an and put 42 in it. And at that point, Python's like, oh, this whole little object that I just created, somewhere it's out here, it's vaporizing it and throwing it away. And so before this line completes, it actually calls our destructor on our behalf. And so that message comes out. So we are allowed as the builder of these objects to add these little chunks of code that says, I want to be involved at the moment this object is created. And I want to be involved at the moment that this object is destroyed. Now, in this last line, an is no longer a party animal. An is now an integer. It's got a 42 in it. It's gone. It's been created. It was used and then it was destroyed. Okay. So you got to be careful if you overwrite something, you can sort of throw the object away. So the constructor is a special block of code that's called when the object is created to set the object up. So we can create lots of instances. Everything we've done so far is we make a class and then we create one instance, one object. And each of these objects end up being stored in its own variable. We have a variable an and we've been using it. But the more interesting thing begins to happen when we have multiple instances of the same class sitting in different variables. And it has its own copy of the instance variables. So let's take a look at this. So this code here, I've taken out the, I've taken out the destructor. Um, and it shows a little bit more information. So now we're going to put two variables in here. We're going to have a, a current score or whatever and a name. And we're going to start it out as blank. And this time we're going to add a parameter onto the constructor. And so the self comes in sort of automatically uh, as the object is being constructed. But if we put a parameter on the constructor call, which is this party animal call, then this comes in as the Z variable. And so self is the object itself. And z, this first parameter, is whatever parameter we put here. Everything we've done so far has no parameter here, but now we have a parameter here. And then that means that when we call this constructor, this line of code comes, and then name is no longer blank. Name is going to be Sally in this particular thing. And then I'll say, oh, self.name, which will be Sally, has been constructed. And so then, then we have this, and that object is now constructed, and then we put it in the variable s. And then we call the party method on that, and we construct a different one. And so this time it calls, and z is Jim. And we basically have a, oops, uh, another copy of this. And so this is how it's going to look, right? As, as it runs down here, as it runs down here, when this is called, it makes one instance and stores that in the variable s. And there's a variable x in there, there's a name in there, there's an init method and party, and that's all in here, right? All that stuff is in here. And now we say, let's make, and that's going to have a Sally in there. All right, Sally in there. And then we're going to do another constructor, and so it's going to make a whole new thing, and it's going to store that in j, and this one's going to have Jim in it. Um, S party, then this turns into a one, and then we're going to call J party. Um, that turns that into a one, and then S party will cause this to be a two. 
Okay, and so what happens is, is we have now two objects, one in the variable s and one in the variable j, and they have separate copies of their instance variables. These are the instance variables or the object fields or whatever, but they're the variables. But the key is, is that every time we do a new construction, it duplicates this and there's another copy of it. So there's an x within s. So s dot x is this variable and j dot x is that variable. Okay? So the next thing we'll talk about is inheritance and that's the idea of taking one class and extending it to make something new. So the last topic we'll talk, talk about here in object orientation is the notion of inheritance. And this is a form of code reuse, and it's one of the more advanced uh, aspects of object-oriented programming. So just kind of understand what it is at a high level, and then you know where to come back to when you need to learn a bit more about inheritance. So the idea is, instead of making a new class from scratch, we actually make a new class by starting with an existing class. We are extending it, or another word for this is subclassing. And it's sort of a, a situation where you're like, I'm gonna, I've got this code and I've got this data and I just need to add a few things to it and then I'll have a whole new thing. Um, and as you design objects and what we call object hierarchies, uh, you often do this. And it's a form of sort of real clever code reuse. Um, but again, don't necessarily think that you're supposed to know when to use this or why to use this. It's right now, it's just terminology, okay? Just terminology. We have what call these as parent-child relationships. The original class is called a parent, and the new class is called the child class. So subclasses are another word for this. You have a class and then you subclass it. I think extending and inheriting and parent-child are, are probably better ways of expressing it than uh, subclassing. So here's a bit of code. Let's take a look at this. Um, this is, this code's unchanged. It's the party animal code that we've been saying all along. Um, it's the one that you, we, we construct and put a name in. And now what we're going to do is extend it. And so you'll notice that this code down here is the part that's doing the extending. So we're making a new class, football fan, and by putting in parentheses before the colon, party animal, that says football fan inherits everything that is party animal, meaning the x, the name, the init, the party, all those methods and data are sitting there, and now we're going to add a new variable. So football fan has, in addition to all those other variables, it has points, and it has a touchdown method. And, you know, point, uh, self points is added, you know, to we add seven of the points, and then we call the party, and we, that does that. So this is calling this method, because football fan includes x, name, and party, and init, and everything, and all this, this constructor. So, th so this football fan is really an amalgamation of all these things together. Party animal is just this stuff, right? But, and so we still have two classes. We don't just have one. We didn't erase the party animal class. And so if we take a look at the code that we can run here, we can say, oh, okay, let's make a party animal, Sally. And so that constructs a, an object like this and then stores that in S and um, with an X starting out at zero. And, and then we call S party Oops, better change that color. Um, starts out at zero, and then we call the party method, and that changes it to one. Okay, and so this is this bit of code. It's as if this part doesn't matter at all because it is a party animal. It's not a football fan. But now, if we take a look at this code down here, take this code down here. We're going to construct a football fan and pass in Jim. But football fan has no underscore underscore init, so that actually uses the underscore init from party animal because we extended party animal to make football fan. So we inherited all of the good that was in there. So there it's gonna make a name, a variable x, which is gonna start at zero, a variable name that's gonna have Jim in it, and a variable points that's gonna have a zero in it. So this j variable has more things in it than the s variable has. And so we can call the J party. And if we call J party, that goes here and adds one to X, right? So that adds one to X. And then we call J touchdown. Well, that comes down in here and adds seven to the points, right? And then calls party within us. And so, so self.party is the current object, i.e. self and J are the same thing, right? Self.party. And then it goes up here and passes self in 
and it adds 1 to the x, in this case, of this j variable. So this becomes 2. And that's where it prints out, it prints out, you know, 7 and 2, and away you go. And so it's a way for you to kind of take all this stuff and stuff it into an, a class by making a new class and just add the extending bits, the bits that are in addition to the other stuff. So like I said, inheritance is a powerful and wonderful concept. It's a form of, uh, excellent form of reuse, but uh, basically the whole purpose of this lecture was so that I could in the future just use these words and you would understand them as compared to I just want to say method, and I've been saying method all along, and it's high time that I defined it. So let's just review one last time. Class is a template. It is not actually a thing. It is a shape of a thing. And we define it and say, when we make one of these things, it's going to have these variables in it. It's going to have these methods in it. Uh, attributes, variables within a class. Uh, method is a function that's inside of a class. Uh, object is once we construct a class we get back an object. And so object here is the snowman cookies. Class is the snowman cookie cutter. And a constructor is a bit of code that sets up our object, our instance, when it first uh, is created. And inheritance is this ability to create a new class, but take all and import and affect all the capabilities of an existing class. So. Object-oriented is awesome. For the rest of this class, we're not going to write any object code. We're not going to use class at all, but we are going to use objects. And literally, you've been using objects from the beginning of this course. As soon as you said um, print, <coughs> whoops, as, you, as soon as you said, you know, x equals high, that's an object. And as soon as you said x dot upper, you were calling a method, right? You've been calling a method all along. When you're doing something like f h equals open this thing you're getting back that's an object and then you do f h dot read or whatever you're calling a method in the dot operator so you've been using objects all along i now am just finally explaining to you when i say call the read method or call the upper method or what's this little dot and why is that there so again it's time for us to understand that but you will it will take you a long time before you encounter a problem that's large enough where, as part of your solution, you're going to make a new object. But when you do, it's really a powerful thing. I, I mean, it, it, it's a really bad idea for me as a teacher to say, oh, write a bunch of objects. It's like, it's, it's premature for that. It's later is when um, you will actually learn how to use objects and you'll be like, oh, thank heaven that these objects are here. Okay? So... Uh, that's all for now. Uh, thanks for listening. See you on the net. Hello, and welcome to our chapter on databases. We're going to learn a lot in this chapter, uh, learn a whole new programming language, SQL, and learn how to use that. So you're going to need a new piece of software to run all of the exercises that I'm going to do uh, called SQLite Browser. We're using a database called SQLite. Go ahead and download this. You might have to pause and come back if you like. Go to sqlitebrowser.org and download it and install it. Um, while you're doing that, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the history. So in the old days, 1960s, 1970s, I started doing computing in uh, 1975. Um, we didn't have a lot of storage. I mean, this is, you know, 16 gigabytes right here. And you know, we didn't even have megabytes. I mean, the computer I had had a few megabytes of stuff. So, it, well, so we didn't have a lot of disk drives. And so permanent storage uh, was often sequential. And these tapes, these tape drives that we had, uh, tapes and tape drives were the scalable part of storage because you could just make more tapes and you could rack them up. And so that was our way of greatly increasing the storage of the computer. The problem they had was is they were sequential. You read it, it advances, read it, advance, read and advance. Now, interestingly, we've been writing programs that do this, that everything we've written so far pretty much reads the whole file, reads the whole web page, reads this, everything we read it. We read it either a loop or read the whole thing. And that's because we have plenty of memory, but we're still reading sequentially. And, um, and so the way you would do this when you didn't have enough spinning storage or online storage is you'd use offline storage, but the trick would be that you would sort it. So let's imagine that you're a bank and you have a bunch of accounts, only a few of which are active on any day, and you have a tape that has 
in account number order from low to high, the, the prior balance, last night's balance of every one of your bank accounts. And then you do all the transactions and you record how much money was taken in or out for each account number. And then you sort those transactions. And then what you do is what we call a sequential master update. And that is you would write a program <clears throat> that would read the first transaction and hold on to it. Say, okay, this is account 45. Then it would read the first account like one and it would copy one and then it read two and read like seven, eight, 42, 43. Then it would read like 44 and then it would read 45, but it would now it would change that and write the new 45 and read the next thing. And so this might be 60. And then it would read a bunch of stuff and copy a bunch of stuff. And then it would finally get to 60 and it would merge the add or subtract. And so the, the old balance ended up here and the new balance did here. And you had to only make one pass through the data. So it was super efficient. So we had all these mechanisms to sort. We used to do punch cards and have sorters and all these things. And then these things would run for hours. And if you watch old TV shows, these tapes are spinning and these things are running back and forth. These are simply reading and writing tapes. Um, and that's how we did a lot of data processing because we could store far more on a tape drive than we could on a disk. And with a racks of tape drives, we could scale the storage that our computers had. And so that's the way we did data processing. But it meant that you, the only way you knew what the old balance was, was it was the balance as of this morning before your bank started. You don't know what the balance was for the day. And that led to things like you can never retreat, uh, return, uh, you can never withdraw more than $100 a day or something like that because you, you don't know what the old balance was or you might go withdraw $100 at a couple of different branches. And, and so they, they, didn't, they weren't able to look your stuff up right away. Now, it didn't take long until the disk drives got better and better and better and you could store the entire accounts, all the accounts and their current balances on computers. And then the, the problem becomes is what happens if sort of in the middle of the afternoon you want to update a balance? Well, do you want to read all your data and then write a brand new one? And that's say that takes like 10 minutes. That means for that 10 minutes, only one person can be updating their bank balance. And so because we could randomly access this data, we didn't have to read it all sequentially. The trick was is how do you spread the data out and then how do you make it so you can change a balance? This is of course second nature today, but how do you make it so you change the balance here without changing the balance there? And you can have multiple people going simultaneously to these things and make sure that you can't say to withdraw money at two different locations simultaneously and somehow have your bank balance get corrupted by that. So there's a lot of debate on how to do that. And in early days, we just did sequential master update, but increasingly we wanted to make better use of the random nature of our computers. And, and our storage. And so that's what led to databases. Databases are the science of how you make use of rotating random access data, permanent data, in a way that allows you to read, modify, and update that simultaneously from many different locations and yet keep the data completely consistent. And so this led to a study of a thing called relational databases. And there's, relational databases are not the only databases um, that, that happened. We had many other kinds of databases and there was a debate. And I remember in the 70s and the 80s, there was a, folks that says, oh, no, no, there you can do index sequential. That's the way to do it. And relational databases weren't popular, weren't all that popular the uh, first time that, uh, that I saw them. I, I didn't like relational databases. But relational databases had an inherent advantage because they were based on some really powerful mathematics. And the interesting thing is, is early on, the relational databases were slower, but eventually they figured out how to sort of bring all the cleverness to bear to make relational databases fast. And so relational databases are a pretty advanced technology, and there are companies like Oracle that are very, very wealthy, and their primary product for many, many years was nothing more than a clever database product, a clever piece of software that was really good at solving this problem. And that's how important this problem was to computing. If you read about databases, you're going to see two sets of terminology. One set of terminology comes from the mathematical background and um, has to do with the underlying math, things like relations, tuples, and attributes. That's kind of like the fancy math version of it. And uh, programmers kind of think of them as rows and columns inside of a table. And so if you look at sort of fancy theory, you'll see words that look like this. And they're just 
full of this and the connection. Now, all this is important and true. And if you really want to get good, you sort of begin to understand the nature that we model data at connections rather than uh, at sort of intersection points rather than just modeling data as a, as a flat file the way we do. But for now, we're, we're going to, as programmers, think of this as just like, oh, it's like a super fast spreadsheet. The super fast part is the math. For us, the rows, columns, and tables are spreadsheets. So think, of, think in a spreadsheet of sheets, sheet, 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 and that's like a table, a named thing like tracks or albums, artists or genres. And then there is rows, and each row has a different kind of data. And then there's columns, and we sort of specialize the first column in many spreadsheets to say what's in there. This is not really the data. This is like metadata. It's like the titles in this first column. That's not really the data, and the data starts here. And we have different kinds of data like strings and numbers, et cetera, et cetera, for each of the rows. And literally, you can get away with this as sort of about 80% of databases is just a really super cool spreadsheet. But under the covers, it is far more powerful than that. So one of the early arguments that uh, happened was, again, what the programming model for this was. And a lot of folks wanted a programming model that reflected how the data was actually stored. Um, the notion of structured query language came about in a way to express what you wanted to happen and allow that to be sort of a very abstract expression. Select all records that meet this criteria, not read, 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 read. And so structured query language is a uh, not a procedural language. It is a it is a imperative language where you're simply saying what you want and then somebody writes the loop, the database actually does the loop, but it's a, a way for you to avoid actually writing the loop. Now that turns out to be the power of databases because the cleverness in how to write the loop is a way that you would probably never figure out how to be most super, supremely optimal when it comes to writing the, writing the loop as you'll see toward the end of joining many tables together and selecting and throwing array and getting down a count or whatever. Someone has figured out how to do that really, really well. So the idea was, is you would express, you know, we're going to create some data, we're going to retrieve some data, we're going to insert and delete it. Create, read, crud, C-R-U-D. Um, <clears throat> create, read, update, and delete, crud. And so that's what this does. It's a, a language that does this very simply. Now, the applications that we're going to use um, this for are more of a data analysis application. We've been doing data analysis for, through the whole course. And the kinds of things that we'll see in the remaining chapters is we'll take some raw data file. These might actually come across the network and we'll write some Python programs to play with that data, parse it, clean it up, make sense of it, you know, and then write it into a database. And this might be a slow process or this might be really nasty and this might be a way to have very clean data. And then we'll write another Python program to sort of read this, read through it, and it's all efficient and pretty. And then we can produce files and maybe we'll visualize it or do work further analysis in our Excel or, or a JavaScript uh, visualization framework. And so in this situation, you will be the person who is both sort of writing the programs, database administrator, and you can, using SQLite Browser, play and look at the database kind of in a raw way. And the first part of this, we are mostly going to be using SQLite Browser just to talk straight to a database. Later, we'll write Python programs that read and write data and, and visualize the data. So, so this is what we're going to do first. And then second, we're going to do this part right here. That's the second thing we're going to do. Now, another really common use of applications and something that if you continue uh, learning more about programming is that you will want to write a, uh, an online application like uh, Amazon or a company or, a, or Twitter that's got a website and it stores dynamic data in databases. And so the picture for that is similar but different than the picture we're going to start out with. And so the way this usually works is that you, the end user, uses a web browser, talks to the application, and the developer writes the application software, and that application software stores its data in a database. And inside that database, we talk to the database using SQL, and all the data is actually stored here, and the magic happens. The data server is that database software that's so precious and valuable. And then there's another person often called the database administrator who has access to the direct access to the data. And these roles in medium and large project are kept separate, mostly because the, mostly because the, um, the production 
while it's running and live, the developer leaves the data alone and works on, say, the next version of the software. Um, and then the developer has a test version of the application that they run on their computer uh, where they're doing all that stuff. And so this database administrator is a, is a role in a large project where we have to run production and, and keep production careful, uh, keep, keep production in good shape. So the database administrator has this responsibility for the production aspects of the data. And you may be working in a situation where that you're not actually controlling the data. The database server is on different computers. You have little special access and you write programs to sort of read the data. Um, and so the database administrator is the person who is asked by the organization to administer that data. The data that we develop, and we'll do this in the second part of these lectures, um, conforms to a data model. That's the metadata. Is this an integer? Is this a string? You know, how many columns is this? And the data model turns out to be very, very important. And there's a lot of science to building an effective data model that leads to really good performance. And it's a, it's a collaborative activity between the, the application developers and the uh, database administrator to make it so it's efficient, runs in production, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of products out there that you may encounter. We're going to be using SQLite. SQLite's a little tiny database server, and it's built into so many things, and that's why we like it. But if you're going to work at a large organization, you could easily run into Oracle, which is the number one commercial uh, product. Uh, Microsoft has a thing called SQL Server, which is a commercial product, and it's also very popular and very effective. Uh, the more popular open source, uh, there's things called Postgres. There's MySQL, and MySQL recently was sort of bought by Oracle. And there is a, a copy of that called MariahDB that doesn't belong to Oracle, MariahDB. Um, and so you uh, most of the SQL that we're going to learn is common across these database because uh, database systems because SQL is a standard. But then there are parts that weren't part of the original standard where each data, database vendor has done things a little bit different. But there is a core common subset that do, does the basic create, read, update, and delete operations. So SQLite is a very popular. You probably have it in your cell phone 10, 12 times. Your web browser has a database engine in it. Your car has a few databases in it. Um, and so SQLite is what's called an embedded database system. Um, Python comes built in with, with it. You just import SQLite 3 and away you go. And uh, so it's a very, very popular because it's free, it's open source, and it is such a tiny little piece of software that you just include it in other pieces of software and use it to solve the data management problems of those pieces of software. Like your browser might use SQLite to store your bookmarks. Now you think, oh, there's only how many bookmarks can you have? But what if there you need it to be fast? And what if there's like people that have 10,000 bookmarks? There probably are. Do you still want it fast? Do you want to be able to search? And so you get all that by using a database like SQLite. And so again, we're going to encourage you to download the SQLite browser so you can follow along with what we're going to do coming up next. And so here is the SQLite browser. Here's what it looks like. And it's just a desktop application. And uh, coming up next, we'll start playing with this desktop application and see how it works. So now we're going to make a database. We're going to use SQLite browser. Hopefully you've downloaded it so you can follow along. And I've got this handout this basic database handout that saves you from having to type all these things. So bring that up in your web browser. And so that gives you all of the commands that I'm going to type now. Um, and so you could pull them out of the uh, either the web page or the uh, um, you can pull them out of the slides or you can pull them out of that uh, out of that. So I'm going to bring up the database browser here. Database browser. Now, the thing that's going to happen, you'll see this happen on my desktop. I'm going to make a new database, and you have to store it somewhere. And so I'm going to put it on my desktop, and I'm going to call it uh, PY4E Fund. And so we should see a new file on my database right there, PY4E Fund. Now, that's a file that you don't want to edit with a text editor or anything like that. This is... Um, uh, a, a database that you're this this is a file that's to be read by SQLite browser and nothing else. Okay, so we're going to create a table and I'm going to make a, a table called users uh, with a column called name that's a text and a column called email. So I'm going to it's already asking me to make a, a table. I'm going to call this users and I'm going to add a field that is called name 
and I'm going to add it text and I'm going to add another field called email and I'm going to make that be text. Now the key thing here is, is we are in effect making columns and rendering an opinion as to exactly what that column is supposed to be used for and we're not allowed to violate that. It's not like, oh, we'll do whatever you want because the database is optimizing its storage based on our in a, a contract that we're, we're effectively making the contract ourselves. We could make these columns anything we wanted, but we're just going to, we have to, we're going to contract with ourselves. And you can see it's kind of small here. You can see there's a create table and that's on the slide. And that's the, the, the SQL way of doing that. This user interface is just helping us write SQL. So now I'm going to just say, okay. And if you take a look, you can see that I now have a table users and I can look at my database structure, the table users and away we go. And so, so now that's, that is creating it. And like I said, here in the slides is the create statement or um, on the web page, there's the create statement that could have done it. Now we can insert some data. Um, let's add a new record to this database users and we'll call this guy, uh, uh, name Charles csev at umish.edu. So now we have a record. So it's kind of like a, a database, a, a spreadsheet. Now that's not the SQL way to do it. There's SQL sort of going on in the background, but if we really want to do this using SQL, we're going to use the insert statement. And the insert statement looks like this. The SQL syntax sometimes has extra words. Insert into is actually an S to L SQL keywords. The name of a table, the columns, and then the word values, and then one-to-one -one correspondence between the values and in parentheses. So it looks kind of like a, a tuple in uh, Python, but we're nowhere near Python right now. Okay, and so uh, that's what we're gonna do. And so I'm gonna grab this, Kristen. And I'm going to go over here to my SQLite browser and say S execute SQL. So now I can say paste that in and then hit this little run button. And that's going to submit the SQL to SQLite and then update that file. And it says query executed successfully and away we go. So if I go back now and I look at the data, I see that there's two, two things in here. And now I can actually insert all the rest of these. Let's go back to my little bit of stuff here. Let's put all these other rows in. It turns out that if I go into the execute SQL and I want to do more than one, more than one command at a time, I can put a semicolon at the end of each one of these things, and then I can run them all four, all at the same time. I mean, one after another actually is what's going on here. So boom, boom, boom. And I take a look at the data and look, I've got all those things in there. Now, Eventually, the thing that's going to generate that SQL is a program, not us. This is we're being the database administrator, so we're sort of doing things manually. Um, once things get going, you write programs, do that insert over and over and over again in Python or a web language like PHP or something like that. And so that is the insert. Now we can get rid of data. And so I'm going to say delete from, that's the keyword, users is the name of a table, where is a where clause, we'll have lots of where clauses in SQL, which is, it's not like an if, it, in effect the delete is going towards the whole table and being turned on and off by this where clause. So delete from users, if you didn't put the where clause on, will actually delete all the rows. But where ted equals, uh, email equals ted at umich.edu, well that one is going to make it so it only applies to those, to the rows that where that is true. So I'm going to go over here in SQL and I'm going to say delete from users where email equals ted at umich.edu and then I'm going to run it. Because it's only one, I don't need a semicolon at the end of it. And now if I go back and I look at the data, ted is gone. Okay. Update. So the update says updates keyword, users is the name of the table, set is a keyword. And then this is column equals new value and then a where clause. Again, this update, if we didn't have a where clause, would change every row in the table. And so where email equals csev at umesh.edu.
Oh, I got to change that because I already got the name to be Charles. So you see the name is already Charles. So I'll just ex execute here. Make this be Chuck so we see it. And then I run it. And then you take a look at the data and it's changed. That's it. That's an update statement. We're doing, you're doing great. You're doing great. And so, um, The next thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at how we retrieve data. Now this is the select statement, select, star, you have a list of columns, and star means all columns, from is a keyword, and then the name of a table. So this select star from users is the kind of thing you type all the time. As a matter of fact, it's what SQLite Browser is doing internally to cause this to happen, but we can do it by hand by saying select star from users, and then run it. And so then we get a little record set that is those four records that are sitting there. We can also throw a where clause on the end of it. So we say select star from users, where email equals csev at umich.edu, and that, again, the select star from users goes at the whole table, and the where clause goes at the whole table, and then filters out all of the things except one record. So the where clause is send it to the table, but then filter based on, on whatever, and so it, it, uh, it only shows us that. Okay, we're cruising right along here. You can also put an order by clause on there. So we can say select star from users, order by email, so that's a column. Select star from users, order by email. And so that orders by email. Or we can change it by to name, and we can say descending. So that's the name and descending order. Sorting and selecting are good things that databases are really good at. So this is the summary of what I've told you. I said the databases do create, read, update, and delete, CRUD. And we've done all those things, except we did create, delete, update, read. That's what we did. And that's the summary of SQL. And so you might be saying, why did I take so long to learn such a simple and elegant and beautiful language? Because it's not really exciting. It's a extremely simple language that's a very predictable, and you're like, well, that's pretty easy. And it turns out that some of you may have been using SQL in situations, maybe with Microsoft Access or something, where you're actually typing this stuff and you, you just kind of typed it and you never realized that you were learning a programming language. That's why I like SQL and that's a very declarative language and it's very straightforward. It's much harder to learn. It's, I mean, it's much easier to learn um, uh, SQL than it is to learn Python because in Python you have to figure out how loops work and how iteration variables work and you'll notice there's none of that. And so, the, but the key is, is we've only started to understand the power. That, that's the simple ability to move around and update data and read data uh, randomly using, using uh, these simple sets of commands. But up, what next, we're going to look at how you do this uh, with data models and relationships and really multiple tables. Hello and welcome to a code walkthrough. In this uh, bit of code we're talking about the emaildb.py. This is a, a beautiful little example in that it sort of reduces uh, talking to the database to kind of its, uh, its pure essence. And so we'll start out this code and we import the SQLite 3 just to get the library there. We make a connection and the, in databases we sort of end up with an open that's two steps. The, there's the connection to the database, which checks access to the file, and the cursor is kind of like our handle. We, it's not as simple as you just open it and read it, but you open it and then you send SQL commands through the cursor, and then you get your responses through that same cursor. So CUR here is the variable that we're interested in. And the uh, first thing that we're going to do is we're going to um, we, we've got this file, it will either create this file, and right now this file doesn't exist. It's going to be in the same director, directory. Oops, email. Yeah, there's no, there's no email DB. So this is actually going to create the file when it runs. Um, and then the first thing we're going to do is drop the table if it exists. Drop table is a bit of SQL. The if exists just keeps this from blowing up if we start with a fresh database. And in this case, there is no file there, so we are starting with a fresh database. So this will accomplish absolutely nothing, which is just fine. Now we're using triple quotes here. I'm just kind of using that to make this a little bit easier to read. I probably could pull those lines up a bit. Um, this, one's, uh, this one's actually small enough that I could 
Maybe I'll just do that. Let's do that. Let's bring that baby right up and turn this into a single quote. That's short enough, right? But triple quote is just, this one here is a little longer, so I'll use triple quote. So we're gonna drop table. That's gonna do nothing first time through. Then we're gonna do a create table. Now, sometimes your application will have like a readme or something. It says, go run these commands to set the database up. But we're able to just set this database up in this particular application. Um, we'll see later ones where we're going to leave the database and not start it fresh. And then this one, we can do the same. Um, and so, but this one, in this one, we could, but in, we're just going to start fresh by dropping the table. So we'll create it. We're going to have a uh, email and an account. Uh, we're going to basically what we're doing here is we're really going to pretend that this is a dictionary. If you recall, when I said dictionary, dictionary is like an in-memory database. Well, now we're using a database to do a database. But the first thing we're going to do here is pretend it's a dictionary. So that's a little crazy. So these next lines of code. Hopefully, are pretty familiar to you, right? Get a file name, um, loop through it, um, check to see if it's if it's you know grab inbox short by default, so we can press the enter key and then loop through it, right? And so this little part right here, this is our basic um, this is our basic loop that we're doing, um, and so uh, uh, you know that that is pretty normal. And if we look at this line right here, that line right there is the line that is. Um, uh, that line right there makes sure that we can uh, only get the from lines. We've done that a bunch of times, and we're going to split it. We're not going to strip the right because the split's going to take care of that. And then we're going to grab the email address, which, of course, in the from line is the second part, um, and, uh, and then uh, we will have that. So now we're going to do some database. So the first thing we're going to do, this, this bit right here is kind of like the dictionary part. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to select count from our database. That is an integer where email equals. And this part right here bears some explaining. This is going to be c7 at umich.edu or whatever. Now, it is dangerous to put those strings, especially from user entered, entered data, into your SQL. You technically could. I could make this be a email equals single quote c7 at umich.edu. I'd have to escape the quotes and stuff. But this question mark is a placeholder. And this is a way to basically make sure that we don't allow SQL injection. Go Google SQL injection um, to get a sense of what that is. Um, it's, more, it's more of an issue in online uh, applications. But in this application, we're just being um, good. And so the way this works is this is a placeholder in this SQL that will ultimately be replaced by this. Now you could have several question marks. We only have one in here. And so you give a tuple. And if we just put email, it won't turn into a tuple. This is a one tuple, basically. This little weird parenthesis email, comma, parenthesis. That is a tuple with only one thing in it. And that's just the weird Python syntax. It's rare that I apologize for Python syntax, but that's a little bit um, less than pretty. But it's OK. It's a tuple. And normally, there would, if there were like two of these, then there would be email, name, da 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 da. Okay? So, so this cur.execute is actually not really retrieving the data. In a way, it's looking at the SQL and making sure that maybe it might verify that the table name is right or if there's any syntax errors, et cetera, et cetera. So, this, this actually is not really reading the data. So, but we have prepared this cursor. This is kind of like the opening of a file, but what we're opening is a record set. We're opening a set of records that are going to, you know, be this wherever it's true. So it's like we're going to read this like a file. Now, in later things, we'll loop through this, but we're only going to say, hey, grab that first one, right? We could have even put maybe a limit clause on there or something. Grab the first one and give it back in row. And so row is going to be a <coughs> row is going to be the information that we get from the database. And so that is, if there are no records that meet this, then row is going to be none. So here's kind of, again, like the, the get. Here's like the get, where if the row wasn't there, because the way we're doing this is we're going to end up with this row in the database. Here's this database. And there's going to be two columns. And there's a bunch of rows. And then here's going to be csev4 and gen3 and Stephen six, right? 
So these are the counts. And so we're grabbing this variable out if it's CSEV that we're grabbing, and that's going to come into here, right? That's going to show up in here. And that row, that row is um, actually, it, it turns out that the row is uh, a list, but we're only getting one thing. And what we really are doing is if we, if we search through and we got through and there was nothing, then row is none means that there was no, and we're seeing like, uh, like Chen's for the first time, and we have to insert it. So if row is none, we're going to run an insert statement, insert into counts, email count. Now we've got to set it to one because it's the first time we've seen it. So values, and then again, the question mark, the question mark basically says, hey, I'm going to have a value in this tuple, and there's an ordering to the tuple, and so there's only one question here, one question mark, placeholder here, and then one is the initial count. So email, question mark, count one, away we go. And so then, then we have, again, we have a tuple that gives to this execute statement, just like in that execute statement, the corresponding sort of strings or integers that, that are to be replaced by each of the questions. So when this runs, there's going to be a new record, and there's going to be a one that's put in there into that new record. If, on the other hand, we pull back a row that exists, we're going to get this four number. Um, and you might think we want to take this four number and add it, but in databases, it's always better to do an update because there might be multiple applications that are talking to this database at the same time. So no matter what update does is in a single atomic operation, it turns whatever this number is into one higher, and we don't have to worry about other pieces of code potentially modifying it. Now, in this case, we don't have to worry about that because we're the only piece of code, but using update to increment something is way better than reading the value and then doing an update to adding one inside of Python and then updating the new value, which is that's two SQL statements, but it's also not atomic, okay? So, if the row is uh, none, uh, if the row exists, we just know that it exists and we just want to add one to the number. We don't. We do have the number sitting here in the row variable, but we don't need it. And so we're going to say uh, update counts, set count equals count plus one, column name, where email equals, and then another placeholder, and then another tuple for the question mark, okay? And so that's what this little bit of code does. That is kind of the, the read it, parse it, check to see if it's there, if it's not, insert it, if it is, update it. And so then we see this con commit. And this con commit, basically the way it works is that the database is efficiently keeping some of the information in memory, and at some point it has to write all that stuff out to disk. So you can choose at times where you put this commit. Um, right now we're going to commit every time through this loop, but you might commit every tenth time through the loop because the, the commit will take some time because it forces everything to be written to disk and these can run really fast and the commit is the slowest part here. So sometimes we do things like commit every tenth record or every hundredth record. If it's an online system, which is not what this is, um, you, you have to commit at the end of every sort of screen paint. But um, for this kind of a system, because we're putting so much in, this is kind of a bulk insert, we might come up with a thing where we you know, every one, every tenth time we do a commit. But ultimately what this will do when this is running is it will build up slowly but surely adding new records and then one, one, and then a build two and a three and all these things and add another one, that'll be one. It'll do this thing, right? And then at the end of the day, that is what's going to be in the database. Now, um, so now we're, so let's take a look what's in the database. And now we can actually read the database. And so in the database, we're going to run a select and we're going to say, we're going to select the email and the count from counts, order by count, descending. So look at that. Isn't that cool? We're getting in the top 10 because databases are good at sorting and they're good at all these other things. So we're going to then execute this and then we're going to ask for the rows one at a time and the rows are going to be a, row sub, a tuple and row sub zero will be email and row sub one will be count. So we run all this stuff and then we close the connection and away we go. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this. Let's go ahead and run all this stuff. Python 3 email db.py. It asks for a file name mbox short. Now I can hit enter, right? mbox short. And that's it. And it looks just like that and it counts it and away we go. 
Now the difference is, at this point, we have a file, emaildb.sqlite, and we can run the SQLite browser, and we can then open this database, and we can see what's in there. So here we go. It is made an SQLite database. We have a table of counts, and then we can take a look at the data, and there we go. We've got the data, and, away, and we can do this. Um, and so let me close this. It's, it's important at times when you, you don't want necessarily to have, uh, well, let's see if we can cause it to lock up. Let me uh, run this again, and it's going to drop this table. So I'm going to run the code again, but this time I am going to do the full one, mbox.txt. Now we'll see what happens here. But it ran, and now so what? What we have to do then to see this date is from the previous run. But if we want the most recent one, we hit refresh, and then away we go. And so we can see this stuff. And so this is just a real simple start to see how you can connect some of the stuff that we've been doing, but store the data in a database. But the nice thing about the database is that it can um, store this stuff from run to run. Even though in this case we're dropping the table every time. Uh, in later things, we will see how we can store data from run to run to give ourselves more restartable processes. Cheers. We are going to do some code walkthrough, and if you want to follow through with the code, you can download the sample code um, from Python for everybody. <clears throat> and so the code that we're going to play with is the Twitter spider code that is both talking to the Twitter API and talking to the uh, to the database. And so what we're going to be doing is we're